You know, for many years, the existence of dinosaur fossils was thought to be a problem for creationists and for the biblical account of creation. Hi, my name is Eric, and what you're about to see is a powerful seminar that combines the last 30 years of research done by Dr. Hoven. It's in a field called cryptozoology, which is the study of hidden animals. The seminar is titled, Dinosaurs and the Bible. Well, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here at Hiles Anderson College in Indiana. How many have been to one of my seminars before or seen one of the videos before? Okay. And how many never have? And how many do not understand the question so far? Good. Same three as yesterday. Good. Um, well, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. And now, for the last 16 years, I've been an evangelist. I speak about 900 times a year now on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. And the evolution theory being taught in our schools in violation of the First Amendment is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of planet Earth. No dumber idea ever. Anyway, I live in Pensacola, Florida. I have three kids, one of each. Got them all married and the dog died. Praise God, I made it. I'm home free. And so far, four grandkids, and that's definitely God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. So <clears throat> hang in there, it'll be worth it all. All my family lives right around me, and they all work in our ministry. So it's great having uh, kids that love the Lord. And a couple of them are back here at the back table back there, and one running the camera. We have in our backyard in Pensacola, Florida, Dinosaur Adventure Land. I like dinosaurs. Our phone number is 479-DINO. Our website is Dr. Dino. Dinosaur Adventure Land's phone number is 478-DINO, 3466 for you alphabetically challenged folks. We like dinosaurs. We have thousands and thousands of visitors come. We've had probably close to 1,000 people get saved coming through our Dinosaur Adventure Land. Everything we do there has a science lesson and a spiritual lesson. We have a blast using dinosaurs for the glory of God. But you know, for the last 200 years, Christians have been extremely confused about where dinosaurs fit into the Bible. I heard a lady last night, I was talking to, witnessing to a lady at the hotel, she said, well, I got a friend that told me dinosaurs never existed. One guy told me, he said, well, the devil put those bones in the ground to fool us. <laughs> well, you're, you're going to look like a real idiot when talking to anybody with normal intelligence when you say something like that, okay? Yes, dinosaurs lived, but when did they live? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Here are two of my grandkids playing with one of the dinosaurs at Dinosaur Adventure Land. We have a wonderful time. Christians, though, often are very confused of where they fit in. What's happened, Christians have compromised the clear teaching of the Bible in order to accommodate the dinosaurs. That's why they have the gap theory or the day-age theory or progressive creation or theistic evolution. There's no need to do that. I'm going to give you the biblical view of dinosaurs here this morning. Now, this guy in National Pornographic, a Geographic, says, No human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Now, just hold on a minute. Does he know that or does he think that? He thinks that. There is no possible way he could know something like that unless he talked to everybody that ever lived. Do you think he talked to Adam and Eve before he wrote that? Did he talk to you before he wrote that? No, okay. That's just not something you can know. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It says, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Well, if he made everything in six days, then Adam must have seen dinosaurs. It's just no two ways about it. And yesterday, we talked about seminar part two, what the Garden of Eden was like. It says, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, <clears throat> and let it divide the waters from the waters. We talked about how God originally created the world with a canopy of water overhead, which all fell down at the time of the flood. It's gone now. And there was most of the water under the crust of the earth, which all came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 136, he stretched out the earth above the waters. I don't know why Christians can read that and read right over it and not see what it's saying. The water that's now in the ocean used to be in the crust of the earth, but it all came shooting out when the fountains of the deep broke open. We cover much more on that on video number six. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? We call it the Hoven theory, so nobody else will get blamed for it. But from the creation 6,000 years ago up until the flood, 
4,400 years ago, the world was very different. During that time frame, the Bible says the people lived over 900 years. They really honestly did. Lived to be 900 plus. It's interesting, many ancient cultures have a legend about what they called the Golden Age. The Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians all talked about a time when man used to live to, near, to be nearly a thousand. Well, that's because it was really true. They really did live to be almost a thousand. And yesterday we covered how reptiles grow all their life. Reptiles never stop growing. So dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They did not live millions of years ago. So the obvious question would be, well, did, did Noah take dinosaurs on the ark? They asked Billy Graham, were there dinosaurs on Noah's ark? Billy Graham said, nope, Noah's ark did not include dinosaurs because they were extinct by the time man got here. Oh, and I praise God for all the good Billy Graham has done, but he is dead wrong about that one. Okay? Dinosaurs on the ark? Well, I hope he kept the woodpeckers in a steel cage of some kind. That'll be important later. People say, dinosaurs on the ark. Now, Hoven, they're kind of big, aren't they? Yeah. The big ones were big, but the little ones were little. <laughs> See, Noah was 600 years old when he built that boat. Okay, he's probably smart enough to figure out, you don't have to bring the biggest ones you can find. Okay, you bring two babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. That'll be important later, okay? <laughs> there are all kinds of reasons for bringing babies on the ark, okay? You bring babies because they're smaller. Well, duh. You know, the biggest dinosaur egg is smaller than a football. You bring babies because they weigh less, they eat less, they sleep a lot more. They're tougher. You know, kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. <laughs> Plus, you bring babies because after the flood, they're going to live longer to produce more offspring, and that's the reason you're bringing them. Why on earth would you bring big elephants on the ark? I mean, that would be stupid for multiple reasons, okay? Why would you bring big giraffes? Just bring babies of everything, young ones. God, and God told him to bring two of every sort. Not two of every species. Two of every sort. He said bring them after his kind, after their kind, after his kind, after his kind. I mean, the Bible's, you know, real clear on the topic. You bring the kinds of animals, not the species. And you only have to bring those in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and only those on dry land. Noah did not have to bring any fish on the ark. They had plenty of water outside, okay? He also did not have to bring any bugs on the ark because bugs don't have nostrils. Bugs breathe through their skin, through spiracles. Insects were not required to be on the ark. Insects can survive a flood just fine. Go any place where there's been a flood, after the water goes down, walk out into the mud and tell me the first thing you notice. Bugs bite a bazillions, right? Yeah, insects did not have to go on there. Some of them might have been on there, but they didn't have to be. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua in his life. Why did somebody do that to the dog? All that special breeding to create a dog that's 100% useless. Noah probably just had a generic dog like my dog, Nikki. We had Nikki for 12 years before I knew what kind of dog it was. A friend of mine came to the house one day and he said, Hovind, you have got a full-blooded canardly. I said, a what? He said, your dog, look at that, that's a canardly. I said, it is? He said, well, look at it, man, you can hardly tell what kind of dog it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, full-blooded canardly, yep. Probably the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor, like this Mexican textbook says. And I would agree, the horse and the zebra had a common ancestor, but it looked like a horse, okay? Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, I mean, all the horse equipment, okay? <laughs> Skeptics say, how did Noah fit those millions of animals onto the ark? Well, the first place, he only brought land animals, okay? Secondly, you bring those with nostrils, no bugs. Uh, thirdly, you bring babies. Now, that's just plain old common sense, right? Fourthly, you bring two of each kind, not every single variety. And since God made the kinds... And God told Noah how big to build the boat. I bet God had it kind of figured out, you know, about what size to make it, you know. Plus, how many were there? Many experts will tell you there are about 8,000 basic kinds of animals in the world. 8,000 basic kinds of animals. Noah had two of each kind. Now, seven of some, I understand. But plenty of room on the ark for that. St. Matthias say, well, Adam could never name all those animals in one day. Oh, come on. When I get excited, I can speak 350 words a minute. At 300 words a minute, you can name all the animals in 26 minutes. 
dog, cat, elephant, aardvark, hamster. I mean, come on, it's not a big deal. Plus, you've got to figure, Adam had an extremely high IQ. I mean, he came straight from the hand of God, fully programmed. He could speak every language in the world. Well, there's only one, okay. I mean, the guy could walk, talk, name all the animals, and get married first day. This guy's super high IQ, okay? No problem naming all the animals in a half hour. Okay, what's next, all right? What else you got for me, God? Plus, how big was the ark? I have atheists that I debate all the time. They'll say, well, Noah could never put all those animals on the ark. I say, really? How many were there? They say, well, we don't know. Oh, well, how big was the boat? Well, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. Oh, I see. <laughs> is that the way this works? Okay. It beats what they believe. They believe 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang where nothing exploded and made everything. And 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. Yes, the planet Earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. And then as the earth formed, the surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. This textbook says there was no oxygen on the earth, 0% oxygen, but the rocks absorbed it. So what? I've been trying to figure that one out for four years. But anyway, then oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. Millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Boy, it sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. <laughs> Life on Earth may have begun in rocks on the ocean floor. Wow, all came from a rock. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So according to their theory, 20 billion years ago there was a big bang. 4.6 billion years ago the earth formed. And it was a hot ball of rock. And then it began to rain and rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. And finally the oceans filled in. And in the oceans the first living organisms appeared. So great, 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 grandpa was soup. That's the evolution theory. I didn't make it up. They did. So, you know, you can laugh at them if you like, as far as I'm concerned. But Now, I, I asked me to come speak at this college in Boston one time. This uh, pastor, I was going to speak at the church. I said, brother, call some of the colleges and see if you can have a debate. I love to do debates against these guys in front of their own university. Well, he called every college within 100 miles of Boston. There a lot of them. There's a lot of colleges around Boston. And finally, one college said, no, we don't want him to come have a debate, but he can come speak to our students if our professors can ask him any questions they would like. Because we would like to show our students how dumb you Christians really are. I said, I would be honored to come for that. <laughs> and so I showed up. There were six professors, all their students. I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, you know. I got my two timelines out over there, and I said, now, folks, I believe the Bible. Nobody cheered. I said, I believe 6,000 years ago God made everything, and 4,400 years ago there was a flood when, you know, everything got destroyed in the, in the flood. And then Noah had two of each kind, not species, kind on the ark. Now, since then, there's been a whole lot of new varieties produced. And then I told them what they believe, because most of them don't know what they believe. You've got to tell them, you know. I said, you guys believe 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. This one professor was getting very angry. <clears throat> I seem to do that to them. <clears throat> he said, Mr. Hoven, do you realize there are nearly 400 varieties of dogs in the world today? I said, sir, I have no idea how many, but 400 sounds good. He said, do you mean to tell me that you believe all those dogs came from two dogs on Noah's Ark? You want me to believe that? I said, sir, uh, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all those dogs came from a rock. <laughs> he didn't have any more questions after that. I did a debate one time in university, and afterwards this lady came walking down the aisle. Boy, she was mad. The smoke was coming out her nose. She was angry at me. She came walking straight up toward me. I said, Lord, I'm coming home. <laughs> she walked up, put her hands on her hips, and she said, Tonight, you told everybody that we believe we come from a rock. We do not believe that. I said, Ma'am, you need to calm down. You're going to blow a gasket. I said, Ma'am, do you believe in evolution? She said, Yes, I do. I'm a professor here at the university. I said, well, ma'am, would you please tell me then where we came from? She said, we came from a macro molecule. I said, and where did that come from? She said, from the oceans, from the prebiotic soup. I said, and where did that come from? She said, it rained on the rocks for millions of years. 
You could see it was slowly dawning on her. You know, I do believe I come from a rock. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you do. Better be careful going outside. Don't step on Grandpa. <laughs> I found her life verse saying to a stock, Thou art my father, to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. There's Grandpa right there. Yep, yep. I even found my daddy's life verse in the Bible. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. Anyway, the Bible says the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with violence through them. I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark. And Noah said to his boys, boys, go for wood. We've got to build a boat. And so they went and got all this wood, and they built this huge boat. Now, after the flood was over, Noah's son had a baby and named him Arphaxad. Why would anybody name a kid Arphaxad? <laughs> Can't you see that kid in kindergarten? What's your name, son? Arphaxad? Do you know how to spell it? No. <laughs> Nobody does. But don't you think one day little Arphaxad's getting big enough? He's sitting on Grandpa's lap and he's looking around like kids do. And he says, hey, Grandpa, I have a, I have a question. Uh, how come we're the only people in the whole world? Do you mean we got this whole planet to ourselves? <laughs> what, what happened? And Grandpa's going to tell him the story about the flood. Actually, they're going to talk about that flood for a long time. We're down in Pensacola. We're going to be talking about Hurricane Ivan for a long time. Okay? And that's just one little storm. Can you imagine a worldwide flood? Man, they talk about that for centuries. Actually, our fact said's daddy, Shem, Noah's son, lived long enough to tell that story directly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You'll never catch that reading your Bible, but when you graph it out, it's like, wow. That's unbelievable. Do you know they're still talking about that flood in many cultures around the world? So far, 270 flood legends have been identified in different countries and cultures around the world. The Hawaiians have a legend that says, Long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Huh, one family saved in a boat full of animals. Sounds kind of like the Bible story, doesn't it? The Chinese have a legend called the Hiking Classic. They say that Fuhai is the father of their civilization. Fuhai is probably Noah. Okay? The story says, Fuhai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. He and his family were the only people alive on earth. After the great flood, they repopulated the world. Interesting. Now, the Mexican, the Tolik Indians in Mexico have a very interesting story. They said, the first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood that covered the highest mountains. One family named Cox Cox survived. 1,716 years. Well, the Bible dates add up to uh, 1656 from the creation to the flood. But that's not bad for a legend 4,000 years old. Question, why would there be nearly 300 flood legends? Uh, I think it's because there was a flood. That's my theory. Okay. Probably the Atlantis legend, everybody's searching for the lost continent of Atlantis. Probably it's another flood legend. As far as the folks on the boat were concerned, the whole world sank beneath the waves. Actually, they were going up. The world wasn't going down. I think Atlantis is another flood story. Anyway, if you look at the country of Turkey, at the far right-hand side, you will see a mountain called Mount Ararat. It is 12 miles from the Russian border. Very politically unstable region. On a Turkish map, it's called Noah Ungumshi, which means Noah's big boat. That's the name of the region. They've got signs. You drive right up to it. Noah's big boat. This way, five kilometers. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. <clears throat> now that's interesting. Noah did not get out till the 13th month. Why would he stay in there for five and a half extra months after the ark rested? Well, we cover all the reasons why on video number six, the Hoven theory, but the Bible says it rested in the seventh month upon the mountains of Ararat. Mountains, plural. The Bible does not say the ark landed on Mount Ararat. Read it carefully. It does not say that. It says it landed in the mountains of Ararat. Actually, there are four theories about what happened to Noah's ark. Okay. One theory says they took it apart and used the lumber for buildings. Second theory says it rotted. The third theory says it's still on the mountain. And the fourth theory says it's in the valley. 
And the guys who think it's on the mountain go over there every couple of years on a big expedition. They climb the mountain. They all come back and say, you know, we almost found it. I'm not sure how you can know you almost found something. But anyway, that's what they say. And maybe, they, maybe it's there. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me at all. Okay. But other folks think, hey, guys, it's not even on that mountain. It's not in the valley 17 miles away. And they think that is Noah's Ark right there, that boat-shaped object, kind of a teardrop shape. In 1960, this was discovered by a high-altitude surveillance plane. In 1978, there was an earthquake, and either it lifted up or the ground dropped down. I don't know. The result's the same. It is now sticking up out of the ground about 18, 20 feet. Hmm. Ron Wyatt died in 99. He was a good friend of mine. He and many others have spent years studying this thing, but they think it's Noah's Ark. And like I said, honestly, I don't know and I don't care. I don't, it doesn't matter to me where it is. And some Christians and creationists get all upset with anybody that mentions there might be another theory besides theirs. Look, my, my approach to any subject if, is if there's more than one option, tell everybody all the options and say, here's the various theories on this. Here's why I believe this one, but go ahead and research yourself. I think you ought to look at all the options. Um, Richard Reeves took over for Ron. There he is in front of his uh, model of Noah's Ark that he built. But according to them, the Ark has collapsed. Obviously, a boat that old would, you know, cave in and fold out to the side. It's splayed. And so one of the arguments the skeptics use is, well, it's too wide to be Noah's Ark. Well, of course it's too wide. Boats all do that. They fall outwards. You can go to any old rotten boat someplace, you'll see the same effect. But radar scans show that there are deck timbers, some kind of huge timbers in there. Apparently, uh, some kind of big structure. They find iron rivets in there. The Ark was bolted together. They knew about iron back then. Not a problem. You can see some of the rivets at the Wyatt Museum south of Nashville, Tennessee. It used a laminated wood, three layers of wood glued together with a tar-like substance, pitch, made from tree sap. And apparently it's like basic plywood, okay? Huge, thick layers of wood. And there's no grain in the wood. Interesting. It's almost like the trees didn't have growing seasons, the wood they were using. Anyway, the Wyatt Museum is a converted gas station just south of Nashville at exit 27 on the northwest corner. You can stop down there and see him. Mrs. Wyatt wrote a book called The Dooms Boat-Shaped Object on Doomsday Mountain, with all the research she and her husband had done on that. Apparently, the ark landed close to Mount Ararat, got stuck in the mud. Everybody got off and left, and at some time later, there was a mud flow or, and or a lava flow that pushed the ark down and broke the bottom off. What used to be the, the keel full of uh, ballast for weight to keep it upright was broken off, and it's way up near the mountain, and the ark has apparently moved down several miles from where it used to be. It used to be way over here at the left at a little village called Kazan, which in Turkish means village of eight. Village of eight. Now, wait a minute. There was eight people on that boat. But apparently the ark has drifted down from where it used to be, and that's another long story. But the government of Turkey has studied all this, and they say, yep, that's Noah's Ark. They even built a visitor center. Now, some folks have said, oh, it's not Noah's Ark. It's a boat-shaped object. It's just a, it's just a flow stone. It's, it's flow formation around a stationary object. When mud flows around something, it makes that teardrop shape like an airplane wing. Yes, I understand. It does. You're right. But the pointed end of the teardrop is always downstream. The rounded end is upstream, like an airplane wing. This one's backwards. There are flow formations in that area, no question. But this is not one of them. One guy argued, it's just a fort. Who would build a fort under a hill? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> the guys throw rocks down inside, you know? <laughs> anyway, some creationists say it's not Noah's Ark, and they get mad at me for even mentioning Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to mention it until I start working for you, and then I'll quit. Okay? But uh, the Bible says the Ark will be 300 cubits long. Now, a cubit is elbow to fingertip. I'm six foot one. My cubit is 21 inches. The average standard Egyptian cubit was 20.65, just a hair shorter than mine. That boat-shaped object is uh, 515 feet long, which is 300 Egyptian cubits. So that doesn't prove it's the ark, but it is interesting. It is the right size, okay? It's about two-thirds the size of the Titanic, about two football fields long. Pretty good-sized boat. In that region near the village of Kazan, they found 12 giant rocks that weigh 9,000 pounds. These rocks appear at Kazan, 9,000 pound rocks, and they have holes in the top. Apparently, this rock was to be held over the side of the boat to be what's called an anchor stone or a drogue stone. And the hole in the top of the rock is curved. I have drilled a lot of holes in my life. I've done a lot of building construction. I don't know how you would drill a curved hole through a rock. But there they are. 
When the Sea of Galilee dried up quite a bit here 10 years ago, it exposed all kinds of beach that had never been exposed in centuries. And all around there, they found hundreds of small rocks with holes in them. It's a common practice in stormy areas like that to put rocks around the side of the boat to keep the boat stabilized. Give it some weight. If it gets windy, you drop them down into the water, and you now have a sea anchor all the way around the boat. But anyway, there are a lot of folks who think these rocks were actually drogue stones or sea anchors for Noah's Ark. What this would do, this would make, make the boat stable during stormy weather. It's almost like you're anchored to the water, if you can imagine that. And if it really gets windy, the rocks are going to drag behind you, and now you're always perpendicular to the waves. You can't capsize. Hmm. One atheist wrote me a letter, and he said, Hoven, I heard your seminar about Noah's Ark having big rocks hanging over the side. You are so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over the boat, it would slow him down? <laughs> I wrote back, where was he going? <laughs> there is no place to go, okay? The whole world's underwater, okay? He's just trying to float. You see, Noah, the instructions are real simple. Get in, sit down, float, land, get out, okay? <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere. No sails. You don't have to steer the boat, okay? One atheist said, well, a sailboat was built with six masts, and it, it leaked so bad because of the twisting from the sails. Well, Noah's Ark didn't have any sails, okay? It just was designed to float. And some people think it might have had a moon pool in the center because a long ship has trouble going over the waves. It tends to lift up, and the ends are exposed, and it tends to flex or break in the middle. Well, if Noah's Ark had a moon pool, that would solve the problem. What it is, it's a hole in the center. As the waves go up and down, the water goes up and down inside that hole. Of course, you've got a wall built up on the inside. It's called a moon pool. As the water goes up and down inside that moon pool, going over the waves, it acts like a giant piston, forcing fresh air in and out of the boat every time you hit a wave. You might actually pray for a good wave once in a while. Hey, Lord, we're about to feed the elephants. Would you please send a wave? Yeah. Anyway. What happened to the dinosaurs when Noah got off the ark? You know, the question of what happened to the dinosaurs has been used in schools to start a conversation about evolution for a long time. One of Satan's favorite tools to use is dinosaurs because kids love them. I spoke at a public school one time to 300 first graders. Try that sometime. I drove a church bus for 17 years and taught junior church for 17 years. And, um, there were 300 first graders in this room, I'm speaking, and I got my dinosaurs out and I said, boys and girls, I got a question for you. When did dinosaurs live? I mean, instantly, all of them shouted out, millions of years ago. I thought, now wait a minute. These kids are in first grade, okay? They can barely read. How do they believe that already? Where have the Christians been teaching the truth about creation? Why are we waiting until the kids get their mind polluted with evolution and then trying to win them back? Why don't we just not lose them to begin with? Why hasn't there been a Christian response to this dinosaur stuff? Where, what the Christians did in the 1800s is they compromised their Bible with the gap theory to accommodate the dinosaurs, and then they let Satan have the dinosaurs. That's what happened, exactly. But anyway, there are 16 theories of what happened to the dinosaurs. One theory says an asteroid struck the Yucatan Peninsula in you know, Mexico and killed them 65 million years ago. A scientist here in Indiana said, the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence. <laughs> they could not stand the heat. I'm not sure what to do about a theory like that, but here's the real reason they went extinct. Mm, smoking. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, what, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Do you realize they're asking the wrong question? The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? See, the liberals are always real good at getting us to argue about the wrong subject. They're always asking me, should we have creation taught in public schools? I say, that's a good question, and I would be glad to discuss that. However, there's another question we should ask first, okay? The real question is, should we have public schools? Mm -hmm. Let's argue that one for a while first, okay? And if we're going to have them, then we'll discuss what should be taught in them and who decides what is taught in them. I mean, does Bill Clinton decide what's taught or does Osama bin Laden decide what's taught or maybe you should decide, maybe I should decide. See, the whole problem is some people have this idiot idea that children belong to the state. 
No, no, no. You see, children belong to God, and they are entrusted to parents. And the parents should decide what God wants them to be taught. The state does not ever have any children. It is sterile, okay? It can't have children. Okay, so they want to steal yours. That's another long, interesting story. But anyway, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says... The federal government only has certain very limited powers, and anything else is left to the states. The federal government has no business being involved in education or welfare or hurricane relief or anything else. No business at all. If you want to see why the schools went public, get this many good articles, one by Samuel Blumenfeld that's incredible about why we have a public school system. It's all part of the plan for a new world order. Big part of the plan. Get our college class, CSE 102. I teach college classes on creation where we go into much more detail, you know, chase every rabbit and kick every dog, and you can get that if you get time. But anyway, dinosaurs getting off the ark had a very difficult time. The climate had changed. Things were different. Remember, before the flood, they lived to be 900. Read your Bible. After the flood, they only lived to be 400, and then 200, and then 100. Something changed. Well, for one thing, that canopy overhead was gone. Number two, the soil was now not loaded with minerals like it's supposed to be to have plants grow like crazy. And the atmospheric pressure was different. The canopy had collapsed. It was gone, I believe. Sunlight was now getting through, radiation, etc. Uh, many more problems in the post-flood environment. Dinosaurs had two problems. Number one, the climate change. Number two, was probably worse, people hunted them. They killed them. Now, they didn't call them dinosaur, though. They called them dragon. See, the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. So for most of human history, these creatures are called dragons. Did you know dinosaurs not even in the dictionary in 1891? For most of human history, they were known as dragons. Now, dra dragons are mentioned in the Bible 34 times. People say, why aren't dinosaurs in the Bible? Last night, I'm talking to this lady at the counter at the hotel. She said, well, dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. I said, that's correct. That word wasn't made up till 1841. And if you got the right Bible, that was translated 1611. So, of course, you're not going to find that word in there. Uh, duh. But they called them dragons. Dragons are listed in the dictionary in 1946 as now rare. <laughs> hmm. As the population of people began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down. Because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. <laughs> Same thing happened in Cobb County, Georgia, where Atlanta is today. Do you realize how many grizzly bears there are roaming around the woods right now near Atlanta, Georgia? Zero. Do you know how many there were just 300 years ago? Hundreds. What happened to the grizzly bears in Cobb County, Georgia? Well, as people move in and civilize an area, the big ferocious animals are killed off or driven off. Happens everywhere. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Cobb County, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? They'd all be dead. Because every redneck in four states would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot one. Right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd have his picture on the front page. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. Yeah, he did. Well, that's exactly what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, they'd be telling stories about you around the campfire from now on. People kill dragons for meat because they were a menace to prove you're a hero, to prove you're superior, competition for land, or for medicinal purposes. Many ancient recipes call for dragon blood, dragon bones, dragon saliva. Why? Gilgamesh is famous for slaying a dragon. A Chinese legend tells about a guy named Yu that surveyed the land of China. It says after the flood, he surveyed the land and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off to the sea and make the land livable again. Many snakes and dragons were driven from the marshlands. Yeah, that's just normal. If you want to build a city, you've got to you know, drive off the dragons and then build your city. I mean, it was expected. You've got to drive the dragons off. Okay? Why would the Chinese calendar have 11 real animals, you know, the pig, the duck, the dog, and a dragon? Why would they put a mythical animal in there? Could it be that at the time they came up with these 12 symbols, there were 12 real animals? Hmm? Here's one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth. It's a piece of slate from Egypt, first dynasty of United Egypt. It shows long-necked dragons. 
We make replicas of it if you want to get one for a prize for your bus route for some give out to the kid who does whatever, you know. You, they go crazy over these things. Half-size replicas of the oldest pieces of pot, piece of pottery on earth. Why would they put long-necked dinosaurs on pottery 3,800 years ago? Hmm. Here's two long-necked dinosaurs with a sheep in between their mouths. Here's a hippo tusk from the 12th century B.C. showing an animal with a long neck and a long tail. There's a cylinder seal showing what appears to quite obviously be long-necked dinosaurs. The Bible talks about a fiery flying serpent in Isaiah 14. Wait a minute, a fiery flying serpent? Well, if you read the story of Herodotus, Herodotus says he went to a certain place in Arabia, almost exactly opposite Buto, to make inquiries concerning the winged serpents. On my arrival, I saw the backbones and ribs of serpents in such numbers as it's impossible to describe. The winged serpent is shaped like the water snake. Its wings are not feathered, but resemble very closely those of the bat. The people where the bones lie at the entrance of a narrow gorge between steep mountains. The story goes that with the spring, the winged snakes come flying from Arabia towards Egypt, but are met in this gorge by the bird called ibises, who forbid their entrance and destroy them all. The book of Josephus talks about the fiery flying serpent that Moses came, had to kill when he came to the land of Ethiopia. And he ended up marrying the princess of the Ethiopians, and which is why his sister got mad at him later for marrying an Ethiopian. Not because she was black necessarily, but because of how this all happened. You read the story in Josephus' book. Anyway, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it talks about in 793 A.D. about the fiery dragons flying across the firmament. The Babylonian god Marduk has shown pictured on a fire-breathing dragon. You say, Brother Hovind, now you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Yeah, I believe there were some. We cover all that in our videotape about Leviathan, but Job chapter 41 talks about Leviathan. It says, Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. You know, I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. Okay, so that's no big deal. But uh, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Now, wait, wait, wait. Was there really a fire-breathing dragon? Well, you better watch the Leviathan video about the fire-breathing dragon. But if you get a Catholic Bible, you find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters in it. It's part of the Apocrypha books, okay? Daniel 13 and 14. Very interesting reading. Definitely not Scripture, okay? But in Daniel 14, it says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, that's permission, you military guys know about leave, okay? And I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation. Okay? The Bible tells us that Daniel was a man who understood science. Those are the kind that Nebuchadnezzar took away at that time. Okay? And Daniel would have known full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. Fat is salty tasting. And almost all animals like things that are salty tasting. And hair won't digest. So he made little lumps of pitch, fat, and hair, tossed them in. The dragon loved them, swallowed them, couldn't digest them. And they plugged up his intestinal tract. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you figure it out, okay? Anyway, Saddam bin Sain, Hussein, has quite an ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. I wondered, why does he call him Saddam? His name is Saddam. Well, Saddam means prince. Saddam means horse's rear end. <laughs> so he called him Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Saddam issued currency with his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Saddam spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. But you know, ancient Babylon was discovered, buried in the dry sand over there. The bricks were just nearly perfectly preserved by the dry sand. So they excavated ancient Babylon and rebuilt it. Babylon was totally rebuilt in the last 20 or 30 years, I believe. Saddam put a brick about every 10 feet around the wall that says, I am Saddam Hussein. I have rebuilt Babylon the Great. I am the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But on that wall, they found carvings of lions and carvings of dragons. 
Now, I can understand why they'd put a lion on there. I mean, we know about lions, but why would they put carvings of dragons on a brick wall 2,600 years ago? Uh, maybe because they knew about uh, dragons? Hmm? They're still there. You can go see them. A friend of mine was there, a soldier. He said, yep, they're still here. Dragons still on the wall from 2,600 years ago. Ishtar Gate is covered in them. Lions and dragons. Hmm. Now, we made a model of it for Dinosaur Adventure Land. If you want to come to Pensacola, that's a little closer to Iraq for most of you. But Alexander the Great said his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India in 300 B.C. This Roman mosaic shows two long-necked dragons fighting or kissing. Now, that would be necking. Wow. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> how, did, how did the Romans know about dragons in 200 A.D.? St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 A.D. Beowulf slew two dragons, and the third one killed him. You should try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. <laughs> Good luck. That's English. 1,500 years ago, that was English. I can only read one word on the page. It says, duh. <laughs> but anyway, when they translate the story to modern English, the story tells us Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms, and the creature bled to death. Pulled off his arm. Well, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood if you want a whole lot more on dragons living with man. But there's a city in France that's famous because a dragon came up out of the water. And a guy killed it and cut the head off and stuck it over the corner of the building. The head of the dragon was mounted on his building. They called it the gargoyle. How many have ever heard of the gargoyle? They still do that today. You can buy these ugly little critters, you put them on your building or whatever over your door. Well, the word gargoyle means throat. We get our word gargle, gurgle, regurgitate, gorge, and glutton from that word. It has to do with the throat. So next time you gargle, you can think about slaying a dragon. You say, Brother Hovind, I am slaying a dragon when I gargle. Mm, okay, anyway. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, Stegosaurus certainly had big spikes on his tail, that's for sure. So did several other animals, but here's a Viking woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a guy. This is from the 11th century, a thousand years ago, okay? The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships a thousand years ago. Why would they do that? Well, they knew about the great dragon of the sea. They called it the Kraken. Again, Bill Cooper's got a lot on that in his book, but the uh, famous Nor uh, Icelandic hero Siegfried slew the dragon Fafner. There's a castle, bricks were found in a castle from the 12th century showing dragons. There's a 12th century castle in Germany with dragons on it. Why would they put dragons on their castles? Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years. When he came back, he said, the emperor is raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he say that? Oh, probably because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. Yeah, okay. In 1611, they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder. Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Uh, let me guess, uh, to feed the dragon. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, right, okay. There's a 13th century castle with dragons on it. There's a gray from the 15th century showing in, carved in brass two long-necked dinosaurs. 16th century castle has dragons on it. We've got seven coins in our museum on loan. They're silver dollars from 1500s to 1600s, real silver dollars. All of them show somebody slaying a dragon. It was common 400 years ago. Everybody knew about slaying dragons. Of course, you've got to slay the dragon. You know, that's just standard procedure. Save the dragon, rescue the princess, or whatever. I don't know. But here's a Russian medallion showing a guy killing a dragon. Bulgarian postage stamp has somebody killing a dragon. The crest of Lithuania shows somebody killing a dragon. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. Indians carved dinosaurs on the walls of the Grand Canyon. Why would they put dinosaurs on the walls of Grand Canyon? Maybe because they hunted dinosaurs around there. Mm -hmm. In 1925, some guys took a raft trip down one of the canyons out west, and they wrote a report. They saw one of these dinosaurs, and they said, the fact that some prehistoric man <clears throat> made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, they upset his theories. Oh, no. Huh. He said, about a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, it's not a dinosaur, it's impossible, because we know dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on earth. Oh, 
hold on just a minute, okay? First place, it's not possible for you to know what happened 12 million years ago, okay? So let's just get that straight first up, okay? Secondly, notice he said 12 million. Now today the kids are taught dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, aren't they? 65 million years ago? It's interesting to see the inflation of the age of the earth. See, in 1770, <clears throat> they said the earth was 70,000 years old. By 1902, it was 2 billion years old. 1969, it was 3.5 billion years old. Today, it's 4.6. Did you know the earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? <laughs> That's 40 years per minute. Okay, it's aging rapidly, folks. Anyway, if you go to Blanding, Utah, you'll see carvings of dinosaurs on the cliff there. Apparently, they knew about dinosaurs in Utah. The Indians knew about them. They killed them, apparently. This is a cave painting in Australia <clears throat> showing a guy running away from what appears to be a dinosaur. I can't pronounce the name of this place in Canada, Mishap uh, something or other here, but it looks like these Indians have painted something on the cliff there that appears to be like a dinosaur with a dermal frill ridged on its back. This is a painting from Australia. These guys are all dancing around what quite obviously looks like a dinosaur. Apparently, they're upset because it ate their friend. Okay, there's the friend inside. You know, give him back, please, right now. Anyway, um, this guy says nobody's ever seen a dinosaur. Well, why did they put them on their cave paintings? Why did they put them on ancient pottery? Why, did, why do we see so many legends of dragons if nobody's ever seen one? Down in Peru, they've got the driest desert in the world. It's only rained twice in 400 years, is my understanding. When the Spanish came across there in 1500s, they found white lines on the desert. They were obviously man-made. Somebody piled up the rocks. There's a pile of white rocks that goes sometimes for miles. Straight as an arrow. These are today are called the Nazca lines. How many of you have ever heard of the Nazca images? They got all these images down there and down in Peru. You can study that if you'd like. But strange, these images are interesting. But one of them shows a spider which has no eyes and one leg is longer than the rest. And for centuries, everybody thought, well, these were poor, ignorant, stupid people. You know, they forgot to put the eyes on and they made the one leg longer by an accident. Recently, there was a spider discovered in the Amazon jungle a thousand miles away. It only lives in caves. It is extremely rare. It's supposed to be one of the rarest spiders on earth. It's an eighth of an inch long, little tiny spider, lives a thousand miles away in the dark, in the caves. The spider has no eyes. And during mating season, that one particular leg grows longer and it exchanges DNA off the tip of that leg for 15 seconds. How did they know that in Peru, a thousand miles away? Maybe they weren't so stupid after all, hmm? Anyway, in 1535, the Spanish conquistadors came through that area and they found stones with strange animals on them. They sent some back to the king of Spain and said, what on earth are these animals carved on these rocks? The king said, I have no clue. Today they're called the Ica burial stones from Ica, Peru. Dennis Swift is probably the world's expert on those. He's one of my good friends from Portland, Oregon. He did a great session at our boot camp in 95, I mean in 2005, our creation boot camp we have in Pensacola, Florida. And we've got his DVDs about him speaking on the Ica stones. Oh, it's incredible. You can still get those on our website. But these stones show dinosaurs on them. The Nazca burial stones from about the time of Christ, plus or minus a few hundred years. Some of them show brain surgery. They find brain surgery instruments, hardened copper, tempered copper instruments for cutting into people's heads, apparently. They, some of them show heart uh, surgery, limb reattachment, steam engine. One of them showed what looks like a steam engine. Strange things are found on these Ica stones in Peru, but quite a few of them, over 500, I believe, show dinosaurs. Why would they have dinosaurs and humans on the same stones? Well, because people lived with uh, dinosaurs. Anyway, there's plenty on that. Here's one from our museum. Shows a dinosaur holding a guy by the head. This one we've got shows what appears to be a guy cutting the head off the dragon because the dragon killed his friend. You can see the friend's body is inside, but his head's missing. So his buddy's just doing what the Bible says. You know, vengeance is fine, saith the Lord. Or something like that. But uh, this guy's jabbing one through the throat with a spear. This one's hard to see, but he's shoving the spear down the dragon's throat. This one, the dragon's got the guy by the arm, and apparently his spirit is leaving. He's flying off into heaven or wherever they go when they die in their culture, you know. This guy's got the knife stuck in the dragon's head, and the dragon's biting the guy. We've got eight of these stones in Pensacola, Florida. It's the largest collection in America, I believe, at $1,500 each. You know, not too many people have these things, but 
Some of them show circles on the side. Now, that's kind of interesting. Why would they put circles on the side of the dinosaurs? Well, nobody ever found dinosaur skin until about 20 years ago when fossilized dinosaur skin was found. It's very interesting. The dinosaur skin has circle patterns on it. They had to see a live one to know to put that on the stones because you couldn't tell that from the bones. We've got some dinosaur skin in our museum in Pensacola. Recently, they just found uh, uh, unfossilized soft dinosaur tissue. Soft dinosaur tissue? So now the brilliant scientists are trying to figure out how could tissue stay soft for 70 million years? The thought will never cross their brain to question that maybe it's not 70 million years old. I mean, that thought will never enter their head, okay? This guy's cutting the head off a dragon. There's a guy riding one. We've got a ton of information on dinosaurs living with man. Sometimes they're in friendly gestures, like this one's petting him. He's got his head laying on his shoulder, okay? Pottery was found with dinosaurs on it. A mummy was found in a tomb wrapped in a blanket, and all around the blanket were dinosaurs. Why would they put dinosaurs on their blankets? Why would they put them on their pottery? Why would they carve them on cliff walls? Why would they put them on their waistbands? In Acumbaro, Mexico, 56,000 ceramic figurines of dinosaurs were found. They knew about them in central Mexico. They have always lived with man. They did not live millions of years ago. But everybody today is saying dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Nobody's ever seen one. Yeah, I think they have, okay. An Italian peasant killed a dragon that was bothering his cows. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display in 1572. By the way, you know why so many Italians are named Tony? Years ago, they were shipping them to America, and they stamped on their forehead, to New York. Just a little bit of trivia there. But the Sutton artifact appears to show what it looks like a uh, pterodactyl with its wings folded up. This lady sent me this picture of the dragon found in uh, Utah. She said, Brother Hovind, looks like a dinosaur to me carved on the cliff up here. Roman artifacts were found in Tucson, Arizona. By the way, the Romans came across the ocean way before Columbus did. Columbus was not the first white man across the ocean. There was trade back and forth for centuries until the you know, Catholic Church kind of had the Dark Ages come in and shut down knowledge and information. But Brenda the Navigator came across in 500 A.D. Roman coins or Hebrew coins were found in Ohio in a burial mound. There was trade back and forth at the time of Christ across the ocean. But in a Las Lunas uh, Decalogue stone here found in New Mexico, there's an 80-ton stone showing the Ten Commandments in Byzantine, which was only used about 500 A.D. is my understanding. Somebody came across, tried to evangelize America, made it as far as New Mexico 1,500 years ago. But one of these Roman swords shows what quite obviously appears to be a dinosaur on it. How on earth could they get dinosaurs on their, stone, on their swords at the time of the Roman Empire? During the age of sailing ships, there are thousands of legends of people sighting sea monsters. Well, if you're in a sailboat, it's kind of quiet going through the water, okay? With a, today, with a diesel engine, they can hear you coming 50 miles away underwater. Of course, you're not going to see one, all right? But there are legends all over of dra dragons living with man. I think we've really been lied to. We could spend a long time on dragon legends. I read prolifically on that topic about dragon sightings down through history. Just get our video number three if you want more on dragon legends. Did you know there are actually stories of giant octopus living in the ocean? I mean, like, really, really, really big octopus. One octopus washed up on the beach in Florida. It was 200 feet across and weighed five tons. That's a big octopus. A whale was killed near Seattle. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus that was 150 feet long. Whales love to eat octopus. And if a whale eats too much octopus, he'll get sick and puke it back up. And if you ever see a piece of puked-up octopus floating around in the ocean... Be sure to grab it. It's worth a fortune. Does anybody know what they make out of puked up octopus? Perfume. That is correct. That explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? Hey, dear. You smell like a puked up octopus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can sleep on the couch for a month, too. Yeah. There are giant squids found out there in the ocean. I mean, really big squids. We could spend a long time about that one. A giant squid washed up on the beach in New Zealand. They said it was a baby. Full grown, it would have been 150 feet long. People say, no, wait, 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 Hovind, if there are dinosaurs mentioned all through history, are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Oh, yeah. Dinosaurs in the Bible? Yeah, we're going to cover that in the next session. 
Dinosaurs not only mentioned in the Bible, some dinosaurs might still be alive. We'll cover that in a minute. Okay, let's take up where we left off about dinosaurs in the Bible. People say, come on, now dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. Well, of course the word's not in there. They didn't make up the word till 1841. The word computer's not in there either, but there really are computers, okay? Um, but yes, dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible. You say, I didn't see them in there. Well, you need to read carefully, okay? If you get the book of Job, <clears throat> the book of Job has 42 chapters. Just about dead center in the Bible, just before Psalms. You find a very fascinating book. In Job chapter 1, <clears throat> it says, Job was a perfect man. He feared God and hated evil. By the way, that's good advice. Okay? And Job had seven sons and three daughters. And Job had thousands of sheep and camels and oxen and asses. The guy was rich. Really rich. Job was probably written after the flood, but before the law was given in the days of Moses. Before the flood, they lived to be 900. After the flood, they lived to be 400. See, Job lived long enough to have 10 kids all grown out of the house. They all died. He had 10 more kids and saw his great-great-grandchildren from his second family. So you've got to be living a long time to accomplish those things. Okay? So those are the reasons why most people think the book of Job was written after the flood during the time when they were still living to be you know, 400. Anyway, one day the messenger came to Job and said, Job, i got some bad news. The oxen and asses were stolen and your servants got killed. And the sheep got burned up. Oh, and by the way, Job, the camels got stolen too. Stock market crash. Get it? Stock? Never mind. Okay. No. Another, another messenger came and said, Job, your, your kids all died. All ten of your kids are dead. Job's having a bad day. And then Job said, The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, what kind of guy is this anyway? Hey, do you do that when bad things happen to you? Huh. Then Satan gave him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And a boil is like, like the world's worst zit, and Job was covered in them. And his wife turned against him. You know, a man can handle just about any tragedy in life, but that's the toughest one right there. There's a verse you probably never heard preached on ever. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about, you know, husbands love your wives and wives submit yourself to your husband. You've probably heard that part preached on. I bet you never heard this part. Let the wife see that she reverence her husband. Treat him like a god. Offer him burnt sacrifices three times a day. Okay? <laughs> Amen. All right. Chapter 2, verse 10. And Job said, you speak like one of the foolish women. Can't we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? And then Job's four friends came to visit him. One of those guys was the shortest man mentioned in the Bible. Bildad the Shuhite. That's pretty short, okay? But these four guys came and they talked to Job for 35 chapters. Most of the book of Job is these guys explaining to Job why everything went wrong. They had to be Baptists the way I got it figured. They said, Job, you must have sinned. I mean, Eliphaz said, whoever perished being innocent. Job, the reason bad things are happening to you is because you sinned. Now, folks, that is the wisdom of the world. Okay? That is not true. See, if something bad happens to somebody, you don't know why it happened. You should love them, pray for them, encourage them, and shut up. Don't go to the hospital when they get their gallstones out and say, hey, brother, these aren't gallstones. These are tithes and offerings. God's getting them out of you one way or another. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> Let God take care of why everything went wrong. He can handle them just fine, all right? So Job is sitting there scraping the pus out of the boils by the graves of his ten dead kids, thinking, God, would you please answer me? Why did this happen to me? Folks, you don't have to live on this planet very long before you're going to be asking that question. God, why did you do this to me? Now, I don't want to drag skeletons out of anybody's closets, okay? But maybe you've had tragedy in your life. I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. I've got three kids here and three in heaven already, okay? Yes, tragedy comes to good people trying to do right. It happens, all right? But if something bad happens, what's your response? Job said, I wish the Lord would answer me. See, Job didn't know about Romans 8, 28. God said, we know all things work together for good. To them that are the, love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Now this verse does not say everything that happens is good. It doesn't say that. 
It says it'll work together for good. I'll show you. Has anybody ever been hungry? You ever been hungry before? <clears throat> Suppose you come to my house, you knock on the door, say, hey, Hoven, I'm hungry. I'll say, come on in, man, I'm going to give you a cup of flour. <laughs> that don't sound too good. I got it. How about a spoonful of salt? Now, that'll fill you up. That ain't going to help. I got it. How about a spoonful of bacon soda? Now, that will wake you up in the morning. Uh -huh. Now, you're probably getting kind of dry by now, so let's pour down a half a cup of Crisco. And chase it down with a cup of buttermilk. You say, Brother Hovind, that would taste terrible. How about if we mix them all together and make biscuits? Did you know the individual ingredients for biscuits taste lousy? But they work together for biscuits. And did you know everything that happens to you might not be good, but it'll work together for good if you love God and you're called according to His purpose. See, the Christian life is so simple. Keep your heart right with God. That's it. Now, that'll be tough to do because the heart is deceitful above all things and <laughs> desperately wicked. But Job is sitting there scraping the pus out of the boil saying, God, would you please answer me? And in chapter 38, <clears throat> the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. You know, if a tornado starts talking to me, I'm going to pay attention. And the Lord said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Hey, Job, your four friends did not know what they were talking about. And by the way, be very careful about getting any Bible doctrine from the book of Job, okay? It's true that the guys said it, but what they said was not true. And cults are always good at picking a verse out here. You better read, read, read the whole chapter, okay? Now, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, but the Bible contains some lies. It accurately records the lies of men. It's true that they said it, but what they said was not true. Okay, that's the case of these four guys. Anyway, God said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? I read that 36 years ago as a brand new Christian. And I thought, what a dumb question. God, why would you ask Job where he was when you laid the foundations of the earth? I said, God... He wasn't there. You know that, and he knows that. So why are you asking such a question? How many of you were here when God built the earth? Was anybody here when God made the earth? Only a couple of Mormons, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're in your second existence. I understand, okay. No, you were not here when God built the earth. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully, okay? Since you were not here when God made the earth, <clears throat> that means that God is older than you are. How many can figure this out with no help at all? Okay? Did it ever occur to you that God is also smarter than you are? Did it ever occur to you that God is stronger than you are? Did it ever occur to you that God is richer than you are? You say, Brother Hovind, everybody's richer than I are. <laughs> okay. Well, God certainly is. Hey, try this one. I've said this one a thousand times and I've never understood it once. But I say it a lot and I think about it till my brain hurts. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? He's already thought of everything. He even knows everything you've ever thought about. The Bible says he understands the imaginations of the thoughts. That's a fascinating verse. He not only knows your thoughts, he knows the imaginations of the thoughts. You see, you can not only think about things, you can actually think about what you are thinking about. Think about that. The brain is amazing. The Bible says God knows the thoughts of man. And by the way, it says in Luke, he, Jesus knowing their thoughts. That's one of many verses that proves Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. God knows your thoughts and he loves you anyway. Wow. Praise God for his mercy, right? Job 38, 4. God said, declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Question mark. Job doesn't answer. Job's not answering any of God's questions. God said, hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Did you know scientists didn't even know there were springs in the sea until 1977? Just discovered. Science is very slowly catching up with a few parts of the Bible. God said, where is the way where light dwelleth? Now that is fascinating. I taught physics. Did you know light doesn't stay in a place, it's in a way. It's always moving. But then it says, as for darkness, where is the place thereof? 
You know the speed of light, 186,282.4 miles per second. Do you know what the speed of dark is? Zero. Darkness cannot move. Now think about it. We are the children of light. We are supposed to be on the move, you know, get something done for God. Right? People say, well, it's getting dark. The world's so bad. Well, then turn on your light. Duh. It's, the reason it's dark is because of you. Right? You're the light. Turn it on. Right? The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Hey, gates don't attack you. You attack them. Yeah, let's go, man. Do something for God. Anyway, verse 24. By what way is the light parted which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Now, wait, wait, wait. Is God telling Job that the light causes the wind? He sure is. And you can ask any weatherman, that's exactly correct. The sunlight causes the wind patterns. The ground heats up, expands the air. We have wind on earth because of the light. Just like God said 4,000 years ago. God said, canst thou send lightnings? Boy, it's a good thing I can't. How many of you can think of somebody that's lucky to be alive because you cannot send the lightnings? I can think of several. Yes, I can. God said, Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are. Now, wait, wait, wait. Is God telling Job that electricity can be used to send a message? Like radio, cell phone, microwave, TV? Electricity sends a message two different ways, through the electricity, through the wire, and also through the electromagnetic force, the radio waves coming off of it. God told Job that 4,000 years ago. Marconi and them guys had discovered it in the last few hundred years. God asked Job 84 questions. Job never answered one. These are the kind of questions that don't need an answer. The question was designed <coughs> to change the person's attitude. These are the same kind of questions you dads have to ask your kids. See, I've got three kids, one of each. I know what I'm talking about. Kids get to a certain age, and they get kind of cocky, and they think, you know, they should make the rules around the house. The kid comes in one day and says, hey, Dad, listen. I believe I should be allowed to stay out till 4 in the morning with my friends. After all, I'm 10 now. <laughs> and Dad says, hold on just a minute, kid. You'd like to know why you can't stay out till 4 in the morning. Well, son, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, who pays the electric bill around this house? Huh? Who's paying for the house? Who paid for them clothes you're wearing, son? Who paid for that bed you slept on last night? Who pays for the food you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat? Who paid for that hot water and soap you took a shower with about a month ago? <laughs> Let's just get it straight, son. The Bible is very clear. He who payeth the bills maketh the rules. Second Opinions, chapter 4. You see, son, me, dad, you, kid. And if you're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, you're going to do it my way. And if you want to do it your way, well, then go get your own roof to sleep under and do it your way. See, that's the golden rule, son. He that hath the gold maketh the rules. Who do you think you are, kid? Where were you when we brought this property and cleared this land and drove off the grizzly bears and marched uphill to school 40 miles in the snow barefoot? Both ways. <laughs> How many got the same speech when you were growing up? You know, okay, good, good. Let's get it straight, son. Me, dad, you, kid. I think that's what God's doing to Job. God asked Job 84 questions. Job never answered one. But Job got an attitude adjustment. See, Job had the same problem that most of us have. He did not have a good appreciation for who God was. Come to chapter 40. God said, Behold now, behemoth. Well, what on earth is a behemoth? Well, whatever it was, Job could behold it. Because God never tells you to do something you can't do. See, God would not say, Behold now, behemoth, if he could not behold now, behemoth. That's deep theology, I know, okay, but think it through, all right? Now, some reference Bibles say behemoth is probably the elephant or hippopotamus. Oh, that is ludicrous. I believe behemoth is the long-necked dinosaur. Now, there are 13 different long-necked dinosaurs, okay? There's the Brachiosaur, the Apatosaur, the Cetosaur. He's got the big seat, okay? There's the Blondosaur. <laughs> you have to talk to her kind of slow, okay? Um, I, say, I think Behemoth is the Apat Brachiosaurus. It says he eats grasses and ox. Some people say, hey, my Bible says elephant and elephants eat grass. 
Well, duh, bunny rabbits eat grass too, okay? A lot of animals eat grass, right? Look at the next verse. His strength is in his loins, his force is in the navel of his belly. The biggest part on him is his belly. And they say, well, elephants have a big belly. Yes, I know. Hippopotamus have a big belly. Brachiosaurus had a big belly. He has a big belly. <laughs> so does he. <laughs> that is just sick, sick. Who would, who would pose for that? Anyway, it says... He moveth his tail like a cedar. Now, hold on a minute. His tail is like a cedar tree. Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? I mean, would that remind you of a cedar tree? Or a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. Now, Brachiosaurus tail, yeah, that's a little more like a cedar tree than the rest of them, okay? You know, before they put those footnotes at the bottom of the Bible, I think they should be required to read the passage at least once. And then comment on it, okay? By the way, you preachers, if you're going to preach on a passage, at least read it once before you preach on it, okay? Yeah, all right. Anyway, next verse says, His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He has big, heavy-duty bones, and they did. This is a real dinosaur toe bone I've got in my museum in Pensacola. One of the knuckle bones from a brachiosaurus. Now, this will be kind of complicated, so listen carefully. The reason he had such big toe bones is because he had... Big toes. How many can figure that out with no help? Four, five, six. Okay. And the reason he had those big toes is because he had a big foot. There's a kid taking a bath in a brachiosaur footprint. Picture's on the book right here on the steps. And the reason he had that big foot is because he had a big leg to hold up. His front leg is 20 feet tall. The biggest dinosaur found so far is 60 feet to the top of the head. Found in Oklahoma. They say it's going to take them 20 years to dig all the bones out of the ground because it is a government project. <laughs> they say when it was alive, it probably weighed 100 tons. Now, 100 tons is equal to 14 school buses put together. That means if he was to come by and step on you, you would be deeply impressed by him. <laughs> you would be road pizza. Mm -hmm. By the way, speaking of government projects, <clears throat> I've got to share with you my new invention that's going to make me the richest man on planet Earth. I'm going to save so much money for the highway department, construction crews, utility companies, and the military. Oh, and all I want is 10% of the savings, and I'll be the richest man on planet Earth. I have invented a shovel that will stand up by itself. <laughs> you won't need to pay those guys to lean on it anymore. Mm, I thank you. I know. <laughs> okay. Next verse says, he's the chief of the ways of God. He's the chief. That's the Hebrew word, resheth, which means he's the chief, he's the principal, he's the biggest animal God ever made. Well, that would not be the elephant or hippopotamus. It would be the brachiosaurus. And that kind of fits the pattern for the way the devil works, you know. Whenever God makes things, the devil tries to destroy them. God makes beautiful things, and Satan always tries to destroy them. Hey, question, how big is your God? I mean, do you ever think about that? When you stop and pray and you say, Heavenly Father, do you have any idea who you're talking to? I mean, have you ever stopped and just thought about that? Who are you about to talk to? I mean, you sit down for lunch, you know, and you're going to pray. Okay, bless the bunch as they crunch the lunch. Amen. <laughs> we expect God to come like a puppy dog when we call, don't we? Okay, God, I got time for you now. Pay attention. Now, here's my prayers. Give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, and give me this, and give it quick. That's about what it boils down to, isn't it? I mean, have you ever stopped and really thought how, who you're talking to? How big is your God? Hey, is your God big enough to tell you what to do, and you just simply do it without question? For instance, does God tell you what kind of clothes to wear? Now, First Timothy says the women should dress modestly. See, my daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Does God tell you how to cut your hair? 1 Corinthians says it's a shame for man to have long hair. Oh, when I got saved, I was a lifeguard. Nice suntan, long blonde hair. I read that and said, oh, wow, I better go cut it. It's just a no question. It's a no-brainer. God, you're not happy? Yes, sir. It's absolutely no-brainer. How big is your God? I mean, who is God of your life anyway? If he's really God, then you read the book, you do what he says, end of story. Hey, does God tell you what kind of speech to have? Ephesians 4 says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Is God happy with everything coming out of your mouth? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
That's a good uh, verse to quote to somebody when you hear them cuss, by the way. Uh, does God control what you watch on TV? Psalm 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Hey, do you put wicked things in front of your eyes? Suppose you made a rule around, just suppose, suppose you made a rule around your house. If you hear a cuss word on TV, you're going to shut it off for two hours. If you see somebody immodestly dressed, you're going to shut it off for two hours. If you see somebody drinking alcohol, you're going to shut it off for two hours. What if you just made those three simple rules at your house? How much TV would you watch? None. So you might as well sell it and give that 30 bucks a month for the cable bill to a missionary and we could, we could win the whole world to Christ, couldn't we? Yeah. Uh, does God tell you what kind of music to listen to? Ephesians 5, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing melody, making your heart, in your heart to the Lord. Is God happy with your music? See, God loves music. God invented music. But Satan has invented some ungodly music you shouldn't listen to. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Hovind, do you know what you get if you play country music backwards? I said, no. He said, you get your wife back, your hound dog back, your pickup back, and you get out of jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God created a male and female. Did you know God invented marriage and the family and sex? I mean, he invented the whole thing. And he wants it to be wonderful. But so he put some rules down. Boys, don't touch the girls until you're married to them. Now, if you don't want to touch them, then stay away from me. I saw your kind in San Francisco, okay? But God put the rules down. <laughs> he put the rules down because he wants the best. He said the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. God doesn't want you hunting for a precious life. He wants you to have a precious life. Hey, do you know why these Hollywood folks have to get married again every six months? Or Britney Spears, 55 hours. Jennifer Lopez, seven months. Brandy Norwood, less than two years, less than six months. Zsa Zsa Gabor, married one day. Do you know why they got to get married again every six months? They're hunting for the precious life. They don't have it. Now listen carefully. Don't pay any attention to Hollywood. They don't have a clue. Not the clue in the world how to have a precious life. If you want to have a precious life, you keep yourself pure till you walk down that aisle and the preacher says, wilt thou, and then you wilt or whatever they do, and then you stay faithful to that one the rest of your life. That is the precious life. Don't believe Hollywood for a second. They don't have a clue, all right? God created the living creatures, every living creature. God made the dinosaurs. He made them. And Satan said, you know, there has to be some way I can use dinosaurs against God. But he couldn't fool Adam, not with dinosaurs. Adam named him. Can you imagine the devil walking up to Adam and saying, Hey, Adam, did you know dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? <laughs> Adam would say, Are you stupid? There's one in the backyard right there eating on a cherry tree. I mean, what do you mean millions of years ago? The devil couldn't fool Noah. I mean, he fed him every day. But for the next 4,000 years, dinosaurs became more rare. They were dying off or being killed off or whatever, you know, some of the reasons they died. And by 1809, they were just nearly extinct. And somebody found the bones and put one together. 1809, first dinosaur that we know of, put together for a museum. Satan was there that day and said, wow, here's my chance. These critters have always lived with man. I know that and God knows that. But these people don't know that. So the devil said, I think I'm going to tell everybody they lived millions of years ago. And if they believe it, It'll make them doubt the Bible. And boy, has it worked good. You know, for the last 200 years, kids have gone to kindergarten and they get a book like this. I can read about dinosaurs. Would anybody like to take a wild guess at what the first sentence in the book says? Millions of years ago. Hey, uh, how many kids are being taught that in your town? At your expense, you are paying for the destruction of the next generation. Now, maybe that doesn't bother you. But it bothers me. And if you think I leave my gorgeous wife and travel all over the world, been gone, let's see, over 200 days a year for years now, flew 215 times last year, spoke over 900 times. If you think I leave my gorgeous wife and my four grandkids because I like being gone, you are mistaken. Okay? They would much rather be home. But there's a war going on. Somebody's got to warn the troops. Hello, to arms. The British are coming. You know, pick up your gun, guys. Let's go. There are kids by the billions being brainwashed on this planet. 
And Satan is using dinosaurs to do it. Nearly all the books say millions of years ago. And then we got some Christians that totally ignore the subject because they don't have an answer. Well, study to show yourself approved unto God. Get the answer and go share it with somebody, okay? Millions of years ago, the book says. I go to museums all the time. just makes my blood boil. You see hundreds and hundreds of kids coming past these incredible displays. I mean, beautiful big dinosaur skeletons. And guess what the sign says at the bottom? Millions of years ago. See, Christians don't seem to understand this. The museums and science centers of the world, that is their church. They are preaching their gospel just like you are trying to preach your gospel. And they're using your tax dollars to preach their gospel. That's how it happens. Millions of years ago. The Bible says, Behemoth lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. Now, the word fens is an old English word that means the swamp. You know, the biggest swamp in the world is in the middle of Africa. It's called the Likwala Swamp. That swamp is huge. Most Americans don't appreciate the size of Africa. Here's what Africa looks like next to the entire United States. Africa is gigantic, okay? That swamp is bigger is the same size as the state of, state of Florida, 55,000 square miles. That swamp is huge. Did you know that swamp is today is 80% unexplored? In 1885, Congo in Africa was taken over by Belgium, and it was called the Belgian Congo for many, many years. In 1960, the communists liberated them. <clears throat> you know how the communists liberate countries. They kill everybody. Okay, you're free now. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> There were reports in that swamp <clears throat> from the 1700s when the missionaries went in there and said, man, there are dinosaurs still living in that swamp. Dinosaurs still alive? 1910, New York Herald ran an article about dinosaurs still living in Africa's swamps. Here's the Saturday Evening Post, 1948. There could be dinosaurs still alive in Africa. A big game hunter named uh, <clears throat> Mr. Gobbler returned from a trip to Angola he announced to the Cape Town newspaper, the Cape Argus, that there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur. The natives call it Chippequi. In Central African Republic, they call it Naguri. Roy Mackle went there in 1980 <clears throat> on an expedition. He spent a quarter million dollars, went back again the next year, he went to that swamp. He said it's the most miserable swamp on planet Earth. The mosquitoes landed on them at the rate of about 1,000 an hour Constantly. I mean, like swarms of dust around you. Bloodthirsty mosquitoes. 95 degrees, 95% humidity all the time. As they traveled around the swamp, the natives talked about this animal called Mahamba. <clears throat> he said, what's that? And they showed him a crocodile. Oh, yeah, that's the Mahamba right there, Mahamba. He said, how big does it get? They paced it off on the sandbar, 50 feet long. Now, if you're a pygmy, four foot four, a 50-foot crocodile looks really big to you, Okay. And everybody says, no, crocodiles, they never get past about 17 feet. Oh, I don't think that's correct. Earlier in the, the summer of uh, 2005, they killed a 24-foot crocodile in that swamp. Of course, the natives will say, oh, you should see the big ones. The natives also talk about an animal they call Mokale Umbembe. Mokale Umbembe? What on earth is that? Well, if you show them the picture of an apatosaurus, they'll say, yep, yep, that's it, Mokale Umbembe. The natives claim these animals live underwater. They're very rare. Of course, they're in the swamp in Africa, and there's, nobody goes out at night anyway, and there's no lights over there at night. But the animals are seen mostly early, early morning or late in the evening when they come out, and their favorite plant is the Malombo plant. There's Dr. Mackle holding a Malombo plant. Dr. Mackle was a University of Chicago microbiology professor, and he went over there and studied this carefully and came back and wrote a book called A Living Dinosaur? Now, he believes in evolution, but his book is great about the evidence for dinosaurs still living in African swamp. They found footprints of the creatures. A missionary friend of mine was there for 43 years as a missionary, Eugene Thomas. He's in Ohio now. Here's his phone number. Call him up. He was there for 43 years. He said, I had two pygmies in my church that killed one and ate it. Dinosaurs. There have been reports of these creatures in that swamp for a long time. One Belgian Congo biologist went up there, upriver 500 miles to, from his house and said, he said he saw one, but his camera malfunctioned because the high humidity apparently ruined all the mechanisms inside. I don't know. But there have been many reports of dinosaurs in that swamp, and you can study this for yourself. Uh, one group went there, and they said the creature was dark brown in color. The skin appeared slick 
and smooth had a long neck and a small head. They heard it, they saw it, it was making a roaring noise, and the government officials even saw it. There's an article here in the Boston Herald newspaper about a group going over to look for the dinosaurs still alive in the Congo swamp. All you got to do is type in cryptozoology. Crypto means hidden. Zoology means study of animals. Cryptozoology, you'll find all kinds of stuff about dinosaurs still living. <clears throat> the natives claim these animals live in caves along the side of the river. Uh, William Gibbons has been there four times now to the Congo swamp. He and I wrote this book together for kids, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. William Gibbons wrote me a letter. He said, According to our guide, Pierre Sima, we were the first white men to actually penetrate the forest and swamps bordering the Buamba River. Our informants, almost all of them Baca pygmies, with the exception of an elderly Cameroonian Muslim, are perfectly familiar with all the known and unknown animals of the swamps. While they do not regard Lakila Mbembe, it's a different language, okay, as being an unusual animal, <clears throat> they do fear the creature because of its ferocity in attacking hippos, elephants, and crocodiles. The animal appears to be completely intolerant of any other large creature that shares the river and controls large stretches of the river, particularly where, those food supplies, where the food supply is present. The two suspected dinosaurians, Mokale Mbembe and Nagubu, are observed and encountered on a regular basis. I question an older Baca couple that work on Pierre's plantation. Like most pygmies, they are very familiar with the flora and fauna of the region. I presented them with our book of known African animals and dinosaur illustrations. About 98% of the dinosaur illustrations were rejected, except for two, which they picked out without hesitation that they had observed, a sauropod dinosaur and a triceratops. Now, why would people in the middle of the swamp in Africa say, oh, yeah, we've seen that one? Missionary Cal Bombay was there for years in Kenya. He said he and his wife saw one of these creatures, but the plates on the back were bigger, more like a stegosaurus. Down in South America, they've got the Amazon jungle, which is huge. In 1907, the British Army sent Colonel Fawcett to mark the boundary between Brazil and Peru. He was an officer in the Royal Engineers and was known as a order, as recorder of, meticulous recorder of facts. In the Benny swamps, he said he saw what he believed to be a diplodocus. The natives and the tribes around there said, oh yeah, that animal still lives out here in the swamp. Colonel Fawcett's son made sketches of the footprints. In 1883, in, uh, Scientific American ran this article before they got committed to evolution. An article like this would never make it in Scientific American today because now they're dedicated to preserving the theory. But they said the Brazilian minister at La Paz, Bolivia, had remitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rio photographs of drawings of an extraordinary saurian killed on the Beni after receiving 36 balls. By order of the president, the dried body, which had been preserved and was sent to La Paz, it was 12 meters long, 39 feet from snout to point. It had scale armor. The neck is long, the belly large, and almost dragging the ground. Professor Gilvetti examined the beast, said it's a member of a lost species. The Indians in that region make small earthen vessels in the same shape, probably copied from nature. Dinosaurs? Vaughn Goff called me three days ago as I was driving up here to Indiana. He said, yeah, the natives in his area uh, talk about a lizard that's 30 feet long, 5 feet tall, makes a thundering noise to startle its prey. The native YY Indians call it uh, Uru Ferry, and they are terrified of this creature. Here's his email. Vaughn at GoffMinistries.org. Email him. They're talking about dinosaurs still in the swamp down there. Here's a giant snake that was killed several years ago. 35-foot snake. It had eaten a man who fell asleep on the job. <laughs> Stay awake on the job, fellas, okay? This snake was reported in Indonesia being 49 feet long. I don't know if it's true or not, but I mean, they might, people might have exaggerated, but that's the reports of a giant snake down there. Colonel Fawcett said he killed a 62-foot anaconda snake. And the natives were terrified. They said, Colonel, if there's one, there's going to be another one. The uh, officials of Brazil, Colombia Boundary, in 1933, killed a 98-foot snake, two feet in diameter, weighed two tons. The cook from a hotel in Amazon said they saw a 100-foot snake that the military hunted down after it killed and eaten two soldiers. The head was five feet long. Reuters News Service reported a 130-foot snake back in 97. This thing floated down the Amazon River. Nobody poked it to see if it was alive, but they reported it's over 100, nearly 150 feet long. Amazon River is huge. Halfway up where a former student of mine was a missionary for years, he said the Amazon River way back here is nine miles wide. That's a big river. 
There's a lake in Scotland called Loch Ness. Has anybody ever heard of Loch Ness? Loch Ness is a huge lake, 24 miles long, a mile to a mile and a half wide, up to 900 feet deep. Loch Ness is big enough that everybody on planet Earth could go drowned in it at the same time. It would hold the entire population of the world. Six billion people would fit in that lake. It's huge. In 1933, a roadbed was cut into the side of the mountain. Because before 1933, if you wanted to see the lake, you got to climb over the mountains or go up river seven miles in your boat. So not many people went there. Very sparsely populated. 1933, the first year the road was put in, there were 52 separate sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. Hmm. This author said there have been 9,000 reported sightings today. Now, that was back in the 1960s when this book was written. Today, it's over 11,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. 11,000. Of course, some are fakes and frauds, okay? I wouldn't trust the, you know, uh, weekly world news, you know, <laughs> where they got all this weird stuff in there. But Sir Peter Scott's a member of Parliament. He said he saw it. He believes it's a plesiosaur. Almost everybody that sees it says it's this animal right here, a plesiosaur. Long neck, four big flippers. One guy wrote a book and he said, some people think Nessie is a plesiosaur. There's one thing wrong with this theory. Plesiosaurs are believed to have become extinct 70 million years ago. Oh, is that what's wrong with the theory? <laughs> I think this evolution theory has got to be the biggest hindrance to scientific research there's ever been. Okay? You look at the facts, forget your theories, look at the facts and come up with your conclusions. Okay? Arthur Grant nearly ran into Nessie on his motorcycle one night. He said, I had a splendid view of the object. In fact, I almost struck it with my motorcycle. It had a long neck, oval, uh, large oval-shaped eyes on top of a small head. The tail would be five to six feet long. He describes it, 15 to 20 feet long altogether. He said, knowing something of natural history, he was a veterinarian student, okay? He said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Here's the sketch he drew of what he nearly ran over on his motorcycle. A 20-foot long plesiosaur. Alexander Campbell was the game warden for Loch Ness for 47 years. He said he saw it 18 times. There's the sketch he drew of it. Many people have tried to catch the Loch Ness monster. They've used everything you can imagine for bait and some things you could not imagine. So, so far, nobody's caught it. I mean, the lake is huge. But there have been many, many sketches drawn. <clears throat> One family said they saw it with a sheep in its mouth. <clears throat> One guy got a picture of the hump sticking out of the water. The neck is over on the far right. Then Reader's Digest, of course, they crop everything down. They cut the neck off when they publish their picture, the crop picture. But Mark McLeod said he watched it for nine minutes through binoculars and made four sketches of it, of what he saw. McLeod said, I think the monster looks like this. <clears throat> All you got to do is, you know, watch TV programs once in a while where they talk about the Loch Ness Monster. There are thousands of people who will go on record and say, I have seen it. World Book Encyclopedia paid to have a submarine taken over there from South Carolina the mini-sub, the guy went down in the water and said, that water is so black, I can't even see the front of my own boat. Loch Ness is like a giant mud puddle. You go down in there just a few feet, visibility is zero. You can't see a thing. Japanese put 24 boats, went all the way down the lake and reported, they scanned the bottom with radar, sonar, and said, man, this is a deep lake, and it's wrinkled up like a raisin. And there are caves going off to the side. Probably with air chambers, the creature can come up under and, you know, go under the, inside the mountain and breathe and live in there. One guy got a picture of diamond-shaped flipper underwater. Again, they thought it was a plesiosaur. Reader's Digest published this picture, and back in 78, the picture's right there on the floor, about Nessie with, Nessie with its mouth open. <clears throat> we can go all day about Loch Ness Monster, but they said this photograph was a fake, and it probably was, but I don't know. It's interesting, they waited till the last guy involved died to announce it's a fake. Now, how do you check out the truth? But anyway, there are other lakes besides Loch Ness. There's Loch Lochie, Loch Morar. There are many other lakes reporting creatures. There's one called the Morguar, the Cornish Sea Serpent by England. The English Channel has many reported sightings of a creature like this. In 1749, <coughs> in England, a creature was caught resembling in some degree an alligator, but having two large fins. The body was covered with impenetrable scales. It had five rows of teeth. 1934, this thing washed up on the beach in Normandy, France. There's a guy uh, standing there looking at it for scale. Uh, a couple of scientists reported this creature swam past their boat in Brazil in 1905. They reported the whole thing in a scientific journal. The creature had a long neck, <coughs> six feet long, <coughs> two feet high, um, 
the dorsal fin, I'm sorry, was six feet long, two feet high, a small head on a neck about seven or eight feet long. Two experienced British naturalists reported the thing. And again, we can go all day on reported sightings. This thing, in 1977, a Japanese fishing boat pulled this up in their net. It was 32 feet long, 4,000 pounds. They said, what on earth is that? The captain said, I don't know, but it stinks. <laughs> when they set it down on the deck, it broke in half, and pus oozed out everywhere. So they made a bunch of sketches, took a bunch of pictures, and shoved it overboard. A special stamp was made for Japanese mail in 1977. Now, some people argue that it might have been a basking shark, and I agree, it might have been a basking shark. But the fishermen on board said, we know what basking sharks are, we don't think it is, okay? Basking sharks, they tend to rot away, leaving the head part behind, but there's a basking shark right there, okay? It could have been a basking, it doesn't matter to me. They said the protein is 96% similar, yes, I know, but nobody's ever seen plesiosaur protein, okay, to know what it's supposed to look like. Humans and apes are similar, but have many differences also. Anyway, there's a lot of arguments about that. It doesn't matter to me, but some people get all bent out of shape because they even mention, you know, the Japanese catch of 1977. Russians report a creature in the lake up there. They're called Mystery of the Lake here. A it looked like a dinosaur washed up on the beach in Russia in 1994. It was 39 feet long. This thing apparently <clears throat> is a doctored photo of a shark. Somebody with Photoshop, you know, made it look like a, a plesiosaur, but actually it's a doctored photo. But... Uh, so be careful. There's plenty of frauds out there, no question. But the existence of a fraud or counterfeit does not disprove the existence of the original. Right? In, in 2004, a bunch of people over in Papua New Guinea reported a creature like a dinosaur, 10 feet tall, with a head like an alligator, or tail like an alligator, a head like a dog, right there on the island in the city of Kokopo. One lady said she saw it. She ran for her life seeing a three-meter tall creature with a head like a dog and a tail like a crocodile. You can read all about it on the internet about this creature seen just in 2004. Japan reports some of these creatures. The North, Lake, North Island, Haikoto, reports them, and the South Island down here of Japan. They call it Ishi in Lake Ikeda. In China, there's reported one called the USO, Unidentified Swimming Object. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Norway has several reported sightings, as do Swedish lakes, a couple of Swedish lakes up there. They call it, anybody speak Swedish, know how to say that? Stores, Jordan. Close enough, yeah, okay. You don't speak Swedish, do you? You're lying, okay. Uh, in Norway, they've got a creature. They, they say it's very similar to the Loch Ness Monster. Hundreds of folks claim they've seen it. It's in the news occasionally, kind of like Loch Ness, okay? Canada has reported sightings of these creatures, Canadian lake monsters. Nessie's Canadian cousin. There's a lake in the town of Kelowna uh, called the Lake Okanagan. It's a huge lake. It's 80 miles long. I've been up there twice to speak in the town of Kelowna. The, na the natives call this creature the Ogopogo. We sell a book uh, on our table back there if you want to get that. The Ogopogo, very similar to Loch Ness Monster. Thousands of folks claim they've seen that one. This article says they were the latest among thousands to see something strange in this narrow 80-mile-long lake. One guy swam the length of the lake and said the thing came up under him, scared him half to death. I got news articles like crazy about this. And she said, I saw Ogopogo twice, this woman says. I interviewed uh, John Caruso. He and his family were sleeping in their boat on the lake. They're camping out on the lake in their big boat. And something bumped the bottom of their boat and woke them all up in the middle of the uh, early, early in the morning. They went out and saw two Ogopogo swimming across the lake. He went back, grabbed his camera. By the time he got it, it was, you know, pretty far away. But he gave me the, uh, a copy of the video footage of what he saw at about, you know, quite too far away to make out the details. But he said, look, Brother Hovind, I saw the Ogopogo. Many, many folks will go on record and saying, I have seen it. There's one in Cadboro, Source, or Cadboro Bay, British Columbia. There's a book about that if you want to read more. A baby caddy was found inside the stomach of a sperm whale. They say it has a, long, a short pointed front flippers and a long necked, uh, uh, long -necked beast with a horse-like head. One guy caught a baby one with his dip net, drew a sketch of it before he released it. He didn't know what it was, so he let it go. I interviewed this guy for an hour. These four guys were fishing in Canada when a creature chased their boat off Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia, when I was preaching up there. Uh, it happened in 1992 uh, when I met him. He said uh, he was 67 when this happened. He'd been fishing out there since he was five. He said this 40 to 50 foot long creature chased their boat for one to two miles. He said the neck was two feet thick and eight to nine feet long. It had nine inch diameter eyes. He said they were six miles south of Cape Sable Island. He said, I don't want to see it again. That's what he told me. This thing washed up on the beach in Newfoundland. Sometimes big blobs wash up. Sometimes it is whale skin, actually. 
The whale dies, gets eaten, and the layer of blubber, you know, washes up sometimes. Sometimes it's a basking shark. Parker Cove, this thing washed up in Parker Cove, Canada. I talked to many folks who said they saw it. A lot of people went and analyzed it. I don't think it's ever positively determined what it is. It might have been a basking shark, but nobody knows positively. <clears throat> but it's gone. People cut pieces off it. The vertebrae do tend to look like shark vertebrae instead of uh, any other kind. It's just interesting that stuff like this washes up on the beach. But we sell a book called Monster Monster about North American lake monsters. Lake monsters and sea serpents. A uh, good book by Lauren Coleman, who is a cryptozoologist, but also an evolutionist, okay? I debate, I, I debate nothing. I, I interviewed uh, Jacques Boivet for three hours. He collects sightings of the Lake Memphremagog creature between Vermont and Quebec, Canada. Hundreds of folks claim they've seen something in this lake up there in Mem Lake Memphremagog. Creature's been seen in the Potomac River. There's a book about the great New England sea serpent. There's an island off Connecticut in Rhode Island called Block Island, where many folks claim they've seen creatures swimming around out there. They call it the Block Ness Monster. <laughs> One washed up in 1996, another was something else washed up in 2004, never was identified that I know of. And I, I interview people all the time. Lake, Lake Erie's apparently got one. Erie's Bessie matches Nessie. They say it's 35 feet long, has a snake-like head. It's in the newspaper once in a while about Lake Erie's monster. Okay, you can read all that for yourself. But uh, <clears throat> A dead baby creature was found on the beach of Lake Erie. A guy took it home, stuffed it, and mounted it. He's a taxidermist. He said, you tell me what it is. I don't know. Dr. Ball bought it. It's in his museum in Texas. It's never been identified. They're not sure what. It may be a fake. Nobody knows, but very interesting little critter. I interviewed the sheriff who saw that was the first guys to see the Situate Harbor monster. 50 feet long when it washed up on the beach. Everybody started cutting pieces off. By the time they got the photo taken, it was pretty butchered up. Some people argued it's a basking shark. Others said it's a real sea serpent. The health department said, we don't care. It stinks. We're getting out of here. And so they blew it up with dynamite. California, 1925, this critter washed up on the beach. That's the head. Here's the neck going down to the right. Just the neck was 20 feet long. What, everybody that examined it said it was a plesiosaurus. 20-foot neck. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hovind, you're so stupid. He said, don't you know that was a whale? I said, now just exactly where is the neck on a whale? <laughs> Ought to be between the head and the flippers. Hmm. He said, it's a rare form of bard's beaked whale. Oh, it's pretty rare, right, with a 20-foot neck. Duh. The people who saw it said it's a plesiosaurus. Why is that so hard to believe? You know why people resist explanations like that? It goes against their theory. They like the evolution theory because it gives them freedom from God. That's why they like that theory. And we could spend all day on cryptozoology stuff. I have studied this for years and love. I've interviewed now 100 people that claim they've seen a living dinosaur. In New York, 1969, the Harbor Police chased something much bigger than a whale upriver. Never did catch it. Could have been a Zooglodon or a Basilosaurus, I don't know. But the White River Monster in Newport, Arkansas has been reported many times. Up until 1973, it apparently disappeared. Arkansas Senate passed a resolution that said it's unlawful to molest, kill, or trample the White River Monster. Off the coast of Jupiter, Florida, something's been seen similar to a dinosaur swimming in the ocean out there. You can read the articles for yourself. A lot of this stuff's on my website, Dr. Dino. You can read all about this. There's a lake between New York and Vermont called Lake Champlain where many people claim they've seen the Lake Champlain monster. I interviewed Sandy that took this picture. I said, Sandy, do you think you saw a dinosaur? She said, no, I know I saw a dinosaur. She and her husband and two kids watched it for 10 minutes. 58 people on the Ethan Allen, which capsized earlier a couple months ago, you know, uh, people, uh, some people think they all ran to one side to see something and fl fl flipped the boat over. I don't know, maybe it's just too many Twinkies, but... Uh, the captain on board back in 898 said, if you, if you think what I saw was a fish, it weighed 3,000 to 5,000 pounds. The Bible talks about the dragons of the waters. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. In Pensacola, where I live, four or five teenagers went scuba diving back in 1962. <clears throat> One survived the trip. Here's what he said. They were going out to the sunken ship in the Pensacola Harbor called the Massachusetts. And here's what he said. Uh, I've got tons of stuff on this. He said, we were in an Air Force rescue raft bound for a sunken ship a few miles off the coast. Midway out, we were caught in a storm and dragged out to sea. When the storm cleared, we were in a dense fog. We began to hear strange noises like the splashing of a porpoise and a sickening odor like dead fish. 
The noise got closer to the raft, and I heard a loud hissing sound. Out in the fog, we saw what looked like a long pole about 10 feet high sticking up out of the water. On top was a bulb-like structure. It bent in the middle and went under. It appeared several more times, getting closer to the raft. The silence was broken once again by something out of the fog. I can only describe it as a high-pitched whine. We panicked. All five of us put on our fins and went into the water. Keep together and try for the ship, I yelled. After we got in the water, we got split up in the fog, and from behind I could hear the screams of my comrades one by one. I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under. The neck was about 12 feet long, brownish green and smooth looking. The head was like a sea turtle, except more elongated. The eyes were green with oval pupils. I don't know how long it was before I heard a scream. It lasted maybe half a minute. Then I heard Warren's call, hey, help me, it's got Brad, I've got to get out of here. His voice was cut off abruptly by a short cry. Brad, Warren, hey, where is everybody? I yelled back at the top of my lungs. Larry now swam with Eric and me. Warren and Brad were nowhere in sight. Right next to Eric, that telephone pole-like figure broke water. I could see the long neck and two small eyes. The mouth opened and it bent over. It dove on top of Eric, dragging him under. I screamed and began to swim past the ship. My insides were shaking uncontrollably. He drew a sketch of the thing that killed his friends. He said, I finally made it to the top of the... Uh, ship and stayed there most of the night. Next morning I swam to shore, was found by the rescue unit. That's the sketch Brian McCleary drew of what he saw that killed his four friends. I was speaking in Fort Walton Beach, Florida one time and Valerie Bill came to me and said, Mr. Hoven, my, my stepson Larry Bill was one of the kids who was eaten. That story you are telling is correct. But the Pensacola News Journal said, after they interviewed him, they said, this is a beach town. You know, people come here to go swimming. We're not going to report that your friends got eaten by a dinosaur, we're going to report that they drowned. So that's what the newspaper said, four teenagers drowned. Panama City, there's something seen there similar. Youth director at a Lutheran church told me his whole youth group was in the van and they saw a creature like that in Panama City Harbor. There have been many reports of dinosaurs still living. There could be some pterodactyls still alive. The natives call the animal the Congomato. If you're in Congo, in, Bat in Kenya they call it Batamzinga. Uh, Steve Romani was, Romandi was on the Kenya Olympic running team. He called me and said, he was going to school in uh, Louisiana. He said, Mr. Hovind, I saw those creatures. He said, we've got them in my village in Kenya. He said, their favorite food is decaying human flesh. They dig up graves and eat the bodies. They kept talking about the Kangamato. Well, we could cover dinosaurs still living for hours, but there have been lots of reports of pterodactyls still around. I get calls about this from people all the time, about pterodactyls being seen in Papua New Guinea or in uh, Indonesia or in Venezuela. Wish we had time to cover all that, about all these pterodactyl sightings. Uh, Dave Wetzel went there and said, man, the natives kept talking about this flying ropen that glows in the dark over in Papua New Guinea. It lives on the island right there. So what's the point? You say, Brother Hovind, who cares? Yeah, I think there might be some dinosaurs still alive. And I think we have really been lied to about the dinosaurs. Now, I don't think there's many, and it's probably safe to go to the dorm, okay? Don't get excited and think, wow, we're going to get eaten by a dinosaur. <laughs> no, it's not that way. The hallway will be clear tonight, I assure you, okay? But the Indians had a legend called the Thunderbird. They said a giant bird got hit by lightning. When they found it three days later, the buzzards had picked the bones clean, but they said the wingspan was 20 feet and had a bony bump on the back of its head. The Indian prayer sticks, to this day, have the head of a pterodactyl on them. Now, Henry Ford put an eagle on the taillight of his thunderbird. It should have been a pterodactyl. You blew it, Henry. Uh, French explorers uh, Jacques Marquette and Joliet stopped near what now is the town of St. Louis and reported they saw a big, ugly bird painted on the cliff on the other side in Alton, Illinois. The Indians said, oh, that's a Piasaw bird. A great chief killed him years ago. They painted the picture up there for years. They finally put a big metal plaque. There's me down below it for scale. They took it down for fear the plaque would fall. I guess they just recently put it back up. I don't know. But if you go to Alton, Illinois, you'll see Piasaw, you know, Piasaw Dairy Queen. <laughs> it's pretty famous over there, whatever the Piasaw bird was. Okay. And we talk a lot about that. Um, people say, well, Brother Hovind, why do you speak about dinosaurs? Well, for one thing, Satan's using them to teach his gospel. It's time Christians, you know, put up a defense. Christians are confused where they fit in. They are a great evangelistic tool. Kids will gather around you like crazy when you get dinosaurs. He's the chief of the ways of God. Well, then God ought to get the glory. 
Now, the Bible also talks about Leviathan, but that's a whole other story. We'll cover Leviathan some other time. So basically, God made everything in six days. Dinosaurs lived with man. People have killed most of them. There could be a few still alive. And Christians need to quit worrying about dinosaurs and start using them for God's glory. Well, this is Kent Hovind. It is uh, August 31st, 1993. I'm sitting here at the Antique Quest in Winchester, New Hampshire with uh, Sandy Mansi. It's good to see you again, Sandy. I saw you uh, back in 92. And Sandy is the one that saw uh, Champ. Her picture appears on the cover of the book uh, by Joseph Zarzinski. Uh, this was, this took, why don't you tell us uh, when it was and where you were and just a little bit about it. I was in Vermont, on the Vermont side, and my husband, when we weren't married at the time, my fiance and my children, we were exploring the lake. I grew up in that area. And we were just exploring the lake, sitting there, enjoying the peace and quiet. My husband had gone back to the car to get the camera, and while he was gone, there was a disturbance in the lake, and I looked out, and I thought perhaps it was a school of fish, and maybe he scuba dive or something, and then the head and the neck broke the surface of the water, and the head picked up in the neck and the back, and I knew it wasn't a fish. Right. <laughs> Well, great. And some people said they, 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 I heard somebody told you that they thought maybe it was a duck. I think it's about a 2,000 pound duck. A 2,000 pound duck. When we were at the church, when you came to hear me speak up in, uh, uh, wherever that was, New Hampshire, Dublin, New Hampshire, you, uh, I had all my dinosaurs on the table and you immediately picked out this one as champ, but you said it was a little different, what you saw. Yes, what I saw is the neck was not near as long and the head is shaped right like a horse head but the neck is not near as long okay now there are three or four different types of swimming dinosaurs that bones have been found of there's the chronosaur which has a huge neck the plesiosaur which you're holding and then there's the elasmosaur uh, had a shorter neck and the head is at a right angle to the body instead of in line with the body uh, there may be others of course undiscovered yet but get that where they can see it on the camera um, I think this more Shorter neck. With a shorter neck. Or, or it could be that the neck wasn't all out of the water, too. Okay. All right, so this was in, back in 1977. Um, how many other people do you know or have you talked to that claim they have seen it also? I have spoken with probably about six different people who have seen it. Mm -hmm. And all of our accounts are very, very similar. So we all can't be crazy and we all can't right. be be telling something that maybe we didn't see. But they're all very, very similar. The shape of the head, the neck, um, just the massive size of it. Okay, now you, you watched it for about how long, would you say? Probably from the time the disturbance uh, until it went back down, maybe eight minutes, ten minutes. Eight to ten minutes, okay. And um, you told me the last time we talked, about a year ago, that when it first came up, it was um, looking different directions it was looking yes. around when it came up it was facing this way okay to me and when it came up out of the water and then it looked around and when i did take the one snapshot it was getting fidgety it was getting a little more movement to it and it had turned its head to look over its back and that's when i got the snapshot and then it turned and then it went down and it started going down like this, and then it put its head down under the water. After it was completely under the water, I heard a boat coming. I heard a boat. Mm -hmm. Never, didn't even see the boat, but I heard it coming. It knew that boat was coming long before my sense of hearing picked it up. Hmm. A lot of people that I've interviewed have told me that, uh, like the ones in Africa, the dinosaurs in Africa, they'll, the natives claim they have very sensitive hearing, and they'll hear you coming and duck under the water. Mm -hmm. I've got missionary friends over there that say there are dinosaurs in that swamp. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm sure of it. God created one. He created many. Sure. And this is something that has to be a creation. It's not It's not something that could have come from an eel or any of that nonsense. And if God can create one, he create many. Sure, right. Now, your, your picture has, uh, as well as being on the cover of Joseph's book, has been in a number of places. It was in Time Magazine, mm -hmm. uh, it's July 81, I think. Yes. You were on Unsolved Mysteries, did you say, this last week? Or? Uh, 
unsolved mysteries has been shown three times. Um, the first was in September of last year, and then maybe September of '92. Right. Okay. And, and then um, recently, about a week or so ago, we had a rerun of it. Oh, okay. So you're a movie star now. No. <laughs> well, there are those who teach that. Evolution is a proven fact that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. I, as you know, am very different. I was a scientist, science teacher, 15 years. I'm of the strong, studied opinion that uh, a few dinosaurs are even still alive. The world isn't millions of years old. Would you say that what you saw was best described as being a dinosaur of some kind, water dwelling? I saw a dinosaur. You felt like you were seeing a dinosaur, right? I know. Not felt. I know. You know. Okay. I saw a dinosaur. Now. The question comes to some people's mind, why did you only take one picture? Because I didn't want to miss anything. Busy watching it. I was busy watching it. I brought the camera up, I took the one photograph, and then I put it down because I didn't want to miss anything. I was in so, such total awe right. of what was happening. And I don't even know why I took the one. It was just instinct. My husband handed me the camera. He had gone after the he camera. He had gone after the camera to take pictures of the children. Okay, before it surfed. Right. He didn't even know anything was going okay. on until he got back there. Sure. And he helped me up the banking, and he handed me the camera so to help me up the banking. And I had it. My knees gave out. I, I was shaking. And I went down on my knees. I picked the camera up. I took the one photograph and then put it down. I had a whole film. You could have taken 20 pictures. Oh, absolutely. Right. But I wanted to watch <laughs> it, and I was... <clears throat> and your mind tries to rationalize. And I'm trying to think, well, what is this? And, and there comes a point when you cannot rationalize, you just stand there and off. Yep. Well, great. Anything else, any other typical questions you get asked? Or, most of the people that interview you are those who believe in evolution. Yes. And how do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. You don't like that? <laughs> I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. and, and I appreciate you letting me use your picture. I put it on one of my posters. Uh, and uh, I have quite a few pictures from different people. And my motive is to strengthen people's faith in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. And uh, there's Sandy's picture. You've been featured in a number of uh, shows and magazines and things like that. You're just, you've lived here how long? In, in, in Winchester? About 20 years. 20 years. So you had no intention of trying to become a celebrity by photographing Jan. No, as a matter of fact, I really didn't even want to publish. I kept it a secret for two years. And then I made them keep it in the scientific world. And I was I was forced by the media to publish mm -hmm. because they were calling, well, if this exists, why haven't we seen it? And sure, right. And so I was forced to, and that's why I had to, I put a copyright on so that I could have some control and some protection mm -hmm. as to who's going to use it. Right. Smart. Good move. Now, people have asked me, they say, hey, if these creatures, if there's so many of these creatures, why don't we get more pictures? And I ask them the question, I'll say, have you ever seen a car wreck? And they say, well, sure. I'll say, give me a picture of one as it happens. You never see a picture of a car wreck as it happens, and yet thousands of car wrecks happen. So it's when a, it's something that's it's fleeting, it lasts a few seconds, you don't think of taking a picture until it's too late. And, well, maybe if you could uh, keep me posted, send me information if you get any more people, Absolutely. other because people probably come to you all the time, don't they, and say, yes. hey, I saw it. Yes. I would like to keep a file of that. Just send me a list. Absolutely. Say, up here on the wall, mm -hmm. and uh, tell me about the old gentleman that came and looked at it. I was standing here at the counter, and an older gentleman came in, and he's staring at the picture, and he's staring, and he asked me what it was, and I told him it was cheap from Lake Champlain. And he went on to tell me that he had never told a soul this, and he was in his 80s, I think he said he was 89 or 87. And he tells me about when he was a young man, and he went fishing with his grandfather up in Lake Champlain, up by uh, the Bulaga Bay, um, that area, up by Thai. He, he grew up on the lake? Yeah, he grew up on the lake. Okay. And he told me of a time that he and his grandfather were out fishing, and this monstrous big thing, he said, came out of the water. And his grandfather told him that it was champ, and that he wasn't to tell anybody due to the fact that he would, they would think that they were insane. Mm -hmm. And so he, all those years, he never told a soul about it. He was, I was the first person he told, and he said to me, I was not insane. My grandfather was not insane. We saw a living, breathing dinosaur. Right. 
And I was like, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. More and more testimony. Yes, absolutely. Now, other people, yeah. other people have seen it and they come to you and say, hey, you know. Yes, and, and I, I, I appreciate that because it gives me vindication. You know? right. I'm not crazy. I'm not prefab. Yeah. This is what I saw. This is what they saw. And we all saw something. And what? Someday maybe the lake will give up her secret. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But let's not kill it. Don't kill it. No. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. You got customers here. We better let you go. those binoculars. Huh? You see those binoculars? It was a shark. No, it's not a shark. Something just came up there. I've seen it, Dad. It's gone. It went under. I think we just see Champ. What's Champ? Lake Champlain monster. It's gone, Clayton. I shouldn't have looked at it with the binoculars so long. I should have got the camera. Oh, I'm under the same way. You started way the heck out there. You know, that buoy, just past that buoy when that sailboat went by. I know. When I was looking at it with the binoculars, I thought it was just a log. It, just, it ran over, but it went right from that buoy oh. all, all the way inland, went underneath right in there. This is a giant squid of the species Archituthus ducks. It came ashore on November the 22nd, 1979 at St. Brendan's on Collier's Island in Bonavista Bay, Newfoundland. It's an immature female. It is a small female, but it is a giant squid. I believe the giant squid reach an approximate maximum size of something like 150 feet. If this is 20 feet long, uh, well then um, it's uh, almost uh, eight times longer than this in overall length, and that's a big squid. In 1976, just 30 miles off the Lizard in Cornwall, two fishermen, George Vinnikin and John Cox, also met a monster. Well, at once steaming 30 miles off, 25 to 30 miles off, saw what I thought was an upturned boat on the, on the horizon. So we went over to investigate. When we got closer, we could see it wasn't an upturned boat something that, well, neither of us have seen before. So uh, it was dark in color, and had sort of humps on the back. I should say it was, well, between 15 and 18 feet in length, and rising above the sea about three feet. It was a flat, calm day. There was no disturbance in, on the sea at all. When well, we got up closer, well, a little closer, I came astern, our amazement up, out the water about three feet from this body, head arrived, head appeared out the water. And it was a, well, thing I've never seen before after about 40 years at sea. And it gradually sank in the water and disappeared. But after talking about it, the only thing we could explain it was, a, was one of, very much like a prehistoric animal. Welcome to Ovi's Open Line program. I do believe that's what's going on in here this morning. Teresa, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're talking about the Ogopogo uh, today. A lot of people in uh, the area have seen it. 
The legend goes on for many years, and we'll be talking to some experts. I believe we've got Arlene Gull coming in. Arlene wrote a book on it. That's right. But well, we're going to go to the phone lines right now. Line two, good morning. Hello there. Mr. Puglis. Yes, go hey, ahead, sir. Uh, you want to know about Olga Pogo? I certainly do. Yeah, okay. I had a taxi, and uh, I took a passenger to the hospital, and uh, and then they, I was coming down uh, Abbott Street. And I got far as uh, about here. I looked to the lake. I was surprised. I seen this thing come out of the water. Well, it's like a like a horse's head with the kind of horns on it. Well, he was huge, you know, standing up there. Oh my, just like a, you know, like a big serpent. Then another fellow come behind me and he says, "What are you looking at?" He says, "I just see no gopogo over there." And uh, he says, where, where? Over there, he says. I, I had the door open the car and uh, stepped out just a little bit and uh, he slipped back in the water, see? And he says, gee, look at the big uh, big waves there. And all we can see is uh, big waves going down there to Fred's place where he had the boat boat rental. And they disappeared, see? And, uh, and then I got all excited. I got in the car and I pulled to the willow in and I told the people, I says, uh, they were having breakfast. I just seen Olga Pogo. And they says, what the heck you been drinking, eh? Line four, go ahead, please. Hello, John. How are you? I'm not too bad. Good. Are you going to give me your name? No, I'm not. Okay. Tell I me saw, about the... I saw Olga Pogo off of Clarsons about four years ago. Okay, you don't want to give your name on the air. No, I don't. Uh, you've told some people, obviously. Uh, yes. Are you afraid that they might think you're a little bit of a... Well, I had some strange phone calls. and uh, I get them every day. That's what they pay me for. <laughs> well, I don't get paid for them, so I don't really <laughs> want, to, want any more, thank you. We were up on the beach having a picnic, and my daughter was on the swings when I saw this creature underneath the wharf there. And when I turned around and saw it and realized that it was the legendary Ogopogo. I just freaked out. I just ran, I grabbed the baby and ran down to the beach and she I guess I yelled over and over, that's him. She was screaming like anything. She just couldn't believe it. Her face was red. And, uh, was fishing or whatever it was doing and it was there for quite some time. Then it straightened out and went along those poles and as it traveled along, it just the three humps were showing, and they were from one of those end of those poles to the other in the space. The three humps were. It traveled along the beach till about the corner over there, and then it turned and went straight across the lake. All right, we're going to break from the phone calls right now and introduce to you some of this well-known in the Okanagan Valley, Arlene Gall. Arlene has written a book. The Ogo Pogo. Good morning, Arlene. Good How morning, are you? Good morning, John. Morning, Teresa. Morning, Arlene. How Arlene. many sightings have you documented? Literally hundreds. Mm. Literally hundreds. When was the first sighting? The very first sighting was in 1852. The first documented sighting in 1852. Okay, 1852, and it's now 1980. 1980. Do we take <laughs> it to uh, mean that there must be more than one Ogo Pogo? There definitely appear to be more than one. There has been a film that was made, and I think it was back in 1968. It's pretty hard not to believe when you see it right in front of your eyes. Tell us about that film this morning. The Folden film was taken in 1968 by a gentleman by the name of Art Folden. He was returning from a trip to his home in Chase. And as he neared the uh, Peachland area, he spotted an object out on the lake. And he said to his wife, look, there's Olga Pogo. And she laughed at him. And he got out and started filming the creature. And what we see in the film is a large animate object moving through the water, surfacing and submerging uh, at various speeds and at various times. And it also shows the creature taking off at very high speed, producing a massive weight. And this is the footage uh, in the film that I like very much because you see a creature just pushing water, something terrifically, with a massive wake in front, just creating uh, huge wave action. This is believability on my part. Have there been any uh, recent sightings? We've had approximately uh, seven to eight sightings this year, but we have one uh, that has been the very best sighting. Why? It was the Rieger family. Well, that 
beautiful day. The water was just as calm as glass. When I just took a look across, I could see a big wave coming. And uh, at that time, I just didn't uh, take much notice of it. And it kept coming closer. And I thought to myself, why would there be a wave coming if uh, there's no wind or anything? So I called to my son. I says, come on back here. And I says, take a look and see if you think what the heck's coming down the lake here. So he took a look at it. And he says, gee, I don't know. So his, uh, we had his grandson. My grandson was along, too. And he said, hey, Grandpa, he says, that's the Ogopogo. It would have ran right into us, but we had to wheel the boat off alongside. And then it, we followed it alongside for about, oh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And I'd say the monster was possibly 14 to 16 feet long, which was above water, sticking above about three feet. And had a, quite a hump on the front shoulders and had a hump on the back where the tail went. And I'd say the tail was par approximately Oh, probably 30, 40, maybe 50 feet, because we couldn't see the end of it. But he did have a long tail. He had four legs. And I'd say the monster weighed approximately maybe 30 ton. And, you know. his, head, uh, and his head in the front was moving from side to side. Uh, it, uh, it seemed like, uh, he, like uh, he was looking for fish or, or, or feeding or something like that. And, uh, he, was, uh, and uh, he was steering up a tremendous amount of water. If I would have never seen it, I would have never believed it. And actually, I don't care if anybody believes me or not. But I, I've seen this animal, and I know it's here, and I know it's a tremendous-sized animal. It was some sort of a, we call it a, a monster fish, for lack of a better word, but it was approximately 30 to 35 feet in length, and its head was protruding out of the water, and... Uh, uh, you could see the flagell action of the tail and the waves going be beyond it. And uh, I took two pictures of it. Well, you said it was roughly similar to this. What was different? Was similar to this. Uh, I couldn't see these fins on the side okay. because they were, if that is the, the, the fish that I saw or, or whatever, mm -hmm. they were not uh, within sight. I mean, I could only see the head and the neck and like the upper part of the body. This is uh, Kent Hoven from Pensacola, Florida. I'm here in Canada at the 100 Huntley Street program. Several years ago, I think 1994, when I was uh, here on the program, I brought my book from Dr. Roy Mackle, uh, A Living Dinosaur. And uh, Cal, who's sitting here beside me, uh, Bombay said, uh, as we, he, was, he said, well, I was in Africa and I saw something like that, a dinosaur. And I turned to this page, page 256 in uh, Roy Mackle's book. And uh, Cal, you said, hey, I saw one of those. Would you take just a few minutes and tell the folks what you saw and, you know, where you work and if they can get a hold of you for any questions and tell, just describe what you saw. Well, it was, it, was, it was probably one of the most startling experiences I've ever had. It was about uh, in 1963, I think, and I was on my way through the old roads of Kenya back to Nairobi to pick up a car. So I was taking this old Chevrolet that was almost too big for those roads for the potholes. And I was going rather slow, and it was a hilly country in, near a place called Muharoni, and uh, that's down in the Rift Valley, but a hilly part of the Rift Valley. As we came up over the brow of the hill, my wife was with me. And suddenly laying there in front of us, right across the road, seven, eight, nine feet long, uh, was what I thought at first was a, a crocodile. And I thought, no, it can't be a crocodile. This is a dry part of the country. And then as I looked at it, we slowed down, stopped the car actually, and, and stood and sat there for 10 minutes looking at this. And as I looked at it, I, I thought, this, this is, I mean, the actual word prehistoric went through my mind. I said, this can't be real. I've seen pictures like this, but not quite like this one. Anyway, from the tail right through to the back of its head were, were uh, I don't know what you call them. Serrations, ridges. Ridges, uh, ridges, yeah. like triangulars, perfectly perfect triangles, all the way from the tail to the, to the, for the head to the tail. And it was just laying squatted down on the road, seeming to sun. And uh, so I, I, I looked at the thing for 10 minutes. I'd, I could shoot myself for not having my camera with me that day, right. but I wish I had. But there it was, and I, I had never seen anything like it, and nor before nor since. And I've asked people. In fact, I went to the Natural Museum and said, have you ever seen anything or heard of anything in Kenya of this nature? And they said, no, there's nothing like that alive today. I said, I saw something. And I, I argued with them really rather intently for a while, and they said, well, it must have been a figment of your imagination. Well, my, my wife and I both saw it, and we, we asked for several years, we asked anybody if they'd ever seen anything like that. Nobody had, nor had I, have I since. But there it was, laying on the road. After about 10 minutes, it stood 
up not quite as high as, as this drawing, but uh, it just kind of wandered off into a very dry, dry part of the country, bushy a little bit, not much greenery. It was a dry time of the year, and it just took off. And Mary and I just kind of looked at each other in wonder, saying, what in the world is this thing? What, what color was it? It was kind of dusty gray. Okay. The, Could you see the eyes? Yeah. They, they'd blink. In fact, it turned its head and looked at, looked at us. You know, it, it didn't seem to be afraid of us. Could you tell from the pupil of the eyeball, was it slotted or round? I, like, I or couldn't, could you see that? I, Not that close? I, I don't think I was close enough to see that. Was the shape of the snout like a crocodile? Would more, you say? more like a crocodile than a than a hippo, say. Okay, yeah, sure. It had a, it had a long uh, face. Now, uh, some of the African people I asked, uh, they said, oh, that was a monitor lizard. Well, I said, impossible. I've seen many monitor lizards. I've never seen one nine feet long. Right. Never as long as that. And I've actually killed a couple of the monitor lizards with my car. And uh, they're smooth skinned and no ridges in the back. I know a monitor lizard when I see one. This was not a monitor lizard. This had those uh, ridges down its back. Could you tell if it had smooth skin or scales? It looked, it looked kind of bumpy, more like an alligator. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, on the sides, mm -hmm. I don't think it had scales. <coughs> okay. I, I can't really be sure. Uh, All right. It, well, it's been a lot of years ago. It's nine, six, I mean, this is 1997. I understand. Well, I've been saying for years there's a few dinosaurs still alive, mm -hmm. and your first thought in your mind was something prehistoric, huh? Well, of course, I've been pre, I, I have been preconditioned by all the education that I'd had up till that time right. that yeah. these things don't exist. Whatever it is, it can't be a dinosaur. That's the yeah. first thought most yeah. people have. Well, well I, I, I considered it had to be some kind of a lizard. Sure. And because you know you have litter lizards from this size of the yeah. little gecko lizards right up to monitor lizards. All right now you work here at 100 Huntley Street, mm -hmm. and they what's the phone number here? So if they have any questions, they can call and ask for Cal Bombay. My no phone number is area code 905-335-7100, extension 3206. All right, well, call them up if you don't believe it. Uh, that's I, mean, not, I saw it. I mean, a lot of people still alive. Uh, when I saw this picture, I thought that's what I saw. I mean, it, All right, it, let's get him to zoom in on this picture if you can real quick, and we'll close out with that. If you have any questions, we would be glad to help. Uh, give us a call if you want more information on dinosaurs. Uh, you let us know, and we'll be glad to send you our videotape on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. So that's what you saw that day, 1962. That's All as right. close as anything I've ever seen. To okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate the time, and uh, God quite, bless you. You're Amen. welcome. Thank you. What you're about to hear is an audio tape made of... Apparently, the roaring of the creature in the Congo swamp, the natives call Mokele Mbembe, uh, which would be one of the few living dinosaurs. The sound appears to have a flapping or slapping sound near the end of each roar. Some have speculated that this may be similar to the gecko lizard that uh, makes a little roaring sound, and then the flap of skin under its throat slaps back against the throat, making the slapping sound. That's the best uh, so far we have on this. If you hear any more, please let me know. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. 
And anybody that will ask Him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask Him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. Forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, If you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. Call or write if we can be any help at all. We'd be glad to help. For more information on the Ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, P.O. Box 37338, Pensacola, Florida, 32526, USA. Or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.